Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, May 16th meeting of the Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission with the clerk. Read off the names. Uh, Chairman Harley. I'm here. Vice Chairman Margiotta. Yes. Uh, clerk Roberts is here. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Reichel. Here. Mr. Hammer. Here. No. Mr. Homicki. Here. Mr. Dean. Here. Mr. Allard. Here. Mr. Edwards. Here. Ms. Antoniak. Yes. Mr. Silva. Here. All right. So if uh, <clears throat> my count is correct, there's 10 of us. And if we do get to voting, somebody has to sit on the side, uh, one of the three alternates. Uh, does anybody remember who wasn't here last or who last excused themselves? Tell you what, let's not worry about it. You know, yeah, we'll worry I mean, about if we get to some voting. All right? Everybody can participate in the dialogue tonight. So the first item, item 3.1, a public hearing for application number 1945-17Z. This is the Borden Weathersfield LLC by Lexington Partners, and they're seeking a special permit in accordance with sections 5.4, 5.10 of the zoning regs for the construction of a mixed use development with 111 residential units. Would the applicant begin by introducing yourselves and then uh, give us a general presentation? Good evening. For the record, my name is Peter Alter. I'm an attorney, I practice law in Glastonbury. Uh, also present tonight uh, and uh, participating in the public hearing uh, will be some or all of the following people. Marty Kenny, who is a principal of Lexington Partners, the proposed developer of the Borden. Uh, Attorney Megan Hope from the firm of Walter and Pearson. Corey Garrow and Kevin Johnson, both of Close Jensen and Miller. Mark Fertucci, Fossen O'Neill, who is our traffic engineer, and Matt Koenig of Barton Partners, who uh, is our architectural firm. Just uh, in advance, Mr. Chairman, I did want to submit for the record the affidavit uh, posting a sign as well as the return receipts for notice. Thank you. Thank you. So that those are part of the record. Uh, of the public hearing. The um, process by, by which we arrive here tonight uh, has been uh, the customary one expected in the town of Wethersfield. We have appeared before the Inland Wetlands Agency secured uh, all necessary approvals from that agency, including uh, for flood zone activity, soil and erosion control approvals, uh, as well as the activity adjacent to uh, the Gough Brook. We also appear before uh, DRAC for the architectural review process. Uh, we made that presentation coincidentally on the same night as we were before the Inland Wetlands Agency and received a unanimous endorsement for the plans that will be presented to you tonight in terms of design uh, and the architectural features prepared by Matt Kennig and his firm at Barton Partners, as well as the landscape plan done by, by Kevin Johnson. Site is served by MDC Public Water and Public Sewer. We have already engaged in planning and implementation with the MDC uh, pending uh, what we hope will be an approval of this project by this commission. The site development uh, calls for uh, limited ingress and egress to and from the Silas Dean Highway through two new driveways, both of which will be limited to right in, right out uh, entrances and exits. Uh, in as much as the Silestine Highway is a state highway, we will be dealing with DOT uh, in terms of uh, the administrative review of the proposed driveway cuts. We have entered into a, a cross easement and parking agreement with the property at 1160 Silestine Highway, the Webster Bank building, 
which is on the corner of the Silestine Highway and uh, Mill Street. That agreement, uh, as is expected by your regulations, uh, has been executed by both the owners of 1160 and uh, Marty Kenny on behalf of uh, the developer of 1178. Uh, obviously, it's contingent upon we are actually getting approval and going forward with the development, but the agreement is fully executed. Uh, Mr. Gillespie asked that it be forwarded to Attorney Bradley for his review on behalf of the town. And I know that Attorney Bradley uh, provided some comments uh, this morning, which we've had the opportunity to review. We don't see anything in his comments that uh, speak to any deficiencies within the agreement. And so I would submit a signed copy of that agreement in Mr. Bradley's letter uh, as required by your regulations uh, and as part of this hearing. Uh, Marty Kenny is a resident of Wethersfield and is the principal of Lexington Partners. Marty and his company have developed numerous successful multifamily and mixed use developments in the Hartford area. And to uh, provide you with some insight into uh, Marty's activities, uh, he has developed properties in Hartford, in Glastonbury, Bloomfield, Windsor, uh, and is currently developing a 250-unit mixed-use project in Glastonbury known as the Tannery. Uh, they are obviously extremely high-quality developments uh, undertaken by Marty uh, throughout the Hartford area. Some of you may be familiar with Trumbull on the Park, which is 100 luxury apartments uh, adjacent to Bushnell Park. It includes 8,000 feet of retail space, 600-car uh, parking garage, um, and uh, Marty com successfully c completed that project uh, some time ago. He then moved to Addison Mill in Glastonbury. Addison Mill was built in 1850 um, and had fallen into uh, disrepair as it had been used uh, periodically only as a warehouse. Marty undertook a complete renovation of that project into 55 luxury apartments. Uh, it's fully occupied practically from the moment that it was completed, continues to be highly successful as a project uh, in Glastonbury, which has uh, really restored a part of Addison Road that had fallen into some significant uh, disrepair. In addition, Marty has developed uh, in more rural settings. Mallory Ridge is a project that Marty developed in Bloomfield uh, in a more pastoral setting uh, with very modern construction amenities, as you see, uh, clubhouse, pool, exercise facilities, common rooms, and other amenities that uh, tenants in, in places such as that uh, are interested in. Windsor Station in Windsor, Connecticut is just about completed and occupied. Uh, this is 130 apartment homes in the center, really, of, of Windsor and as part of the revitalization of uh, the center core of, of Windsor uh, as uh, it rehabilitates the downtown around the town hall and adjacent to Loomis Chafee School. And finally, at least for the moment, Marty's most ambitious project is the reconstruction of the tannery buildings on New London Turnpike in Glastonbury. That's the brick building that you see in the foreground of uh, the upper photograph. Uh, and then, in addition to that, there is new construction in five additional buildings along the ridge line to the rear of uh, the restored mill. This is a mixed-use development. It will have a restaurant, other uh, commercial space available to it. Uh, and um, 
first three buildings are CO'd and being occupied as we speak. Um, and it has been very, very well received in Glastonbury as a high quality development. Marty's interest in the Borden really comes from the Silas Dean vision for reinvestment plan that was developed uh, starting in 2006 uh, in this community in conjunction with uh, Rocky Hill. Marty, as a resident of Wethersfield, had watched the fun zone building continue to be vacant, continue to fall into greater and greater disrepair uh, as no tenants could be found to occupy it in its current state. He directed our firm and, and uh, Barton Partners, as well as Close Jensen and Miller, to undertake a careful review of the Silas Dean vision plan and your zoning regulations to better understand what could be done with the property uh, in keeping with that uh, plan that had evolved for the Silas Dean. And it seems to be, at least to us, a perfect fit with what we propose. Uh, this will be a mixed use development with restaurant and retail uses on the first floor residential uses above. It will be a higher density, density residential housing, which will add to uh, residential population in areas that can support the commercial endeavors around it, and also provide a transition from the less dense residential neighborhoods, such as on Middletown Avenue and on the westerly side of the Silas Dean Highway. Uh, Part of, and a critical part of this agreement was to create a uh, cross easement and cross parking arrangement with 1160 Silas Dean Highway. Not only does the, the plan speak to that, but your zoning regulation speaks to it as well. And Marty has engaged in a uh, process of negotiation with the owners of 1160 Silas Dean Highway, the Webster Bank building that resulted in the agreement that we've presented as part of the record tonight. Again, it speaks to the purposes and goals of the plan that evolved in terms of interconnecting parking lots uh, to provide greater opportunities for people to uh, make use of parking and other opportunities without going in and out of public roadways. You'll see from Kevin Johnson's presentation that we have a significant landscaping plan along uh, the Silas Dean Highway. We have put the parking to the rear of the buildings as the plan directs so that there is no parking fronting on the Silas Dean Highway. We are proposing a building uh, that is higher than would otherwise be permitted in this zone. We average about 63 feet along the parapet. Uh, with some higher pediments, uh, which will be explained uh, in more detail by Matt Koenig when he talks about the architecture. Matt will also speak to the guidelines uh, that he utilized in designing this building. And uh, make no mistake, Marty had a commitment to creating an iconic building on the Silas Dean Highway. Turned away from kind of a colonial brick, white um, trim building um, in, and directed his planning team to do something much more significant, much more modern and, and much more unique than anything else on the Silas Dean Highway. He believes that that is consistent with the plan. There is language in the plan and the architectural provisions that uh, suggest that. Uh, but in addition to that, he felt that it was time to offer something on the Silas Dean Highway that, that would draw people to it and, and make it a place where, where a lot of people want to live as a unique living opportunity. And he viewed this site, the 1178 site, as one having been identified as a potential investment property by the plan as a real opportunity to satisfy the benchmarks of the plan, the goals of the plan, but also to
create a highly marketable uh, property that would attract uh, tenants at uh, market rate units, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on a continuing basis. So he's very much committed to that process. Part of our application tonight is a request for several waivers. Your uh, regulation provides that this commission, if it's satisfied that the regulation, the intent of the regulation is being met, that it has the ability to grant the waivers. Um, and we feel that we're gonna present you with an appropriate plan tonight that um, should generate the kind of support we believe it has um, so that uh, such a worthwhile endeavor can be put into effect with the granting of some really minimal waivers for the most part. Site is about three acres. Um, it uh, currently has, as you know, a single story uh, building, last known as the fun zone. Before that, it housed an aluminum uh, manufacturing company, but was originally part of the Borden Dairy Farm, which is where uh, the name the Borden comes from. Obviously, as part of this process, the entire building uh, will be raised, uh, taken from the site, uh, so that new construction can take place. That would be the first undertaking in the construction sequence. Uh, this building, as I'm sure everybody who lives in Weathersfield and drives up and down the Silesian Highway knows, has been va vacant and uh, empty for quite a long time. Uh, I've heard people estimate anywhere from 15 to 20 years since it was last in active use. So we believe that uh, we're going to present you tonight with a plan that uh, speaks to and meets all of the goals of the vision plan, meets all of the requirements of uh, the mixed use development that we propose uh, under your regulation. And with the exception of the waivers, which we will go into uh, as we move through this process, um, we think that we satisfy each and every requirement of your regulations. Corey Garrow and, and Kevin Johnson are going to speak to the site plan, describe uh, how the site will be developed, what steps have been taken to enhance uh, stormwater management, for example, and uh, the overall development of the site, as well as uh, the site design and landscaping that we propose. Part of the requirements of your regulation is to provide not only a traffic analysis, but also a parking analysis. We provided both of those reports in advance. Mark Fertucci from Fuss and O'Neill is our traffic engineer, and he will speak to both of those uh, reports that we, that we have submitted. Matt Koenig will take you through the architectural design and the, and, uh, the materials that he proposes to use on the building and the overall uh, vision that, that Marty has uh, directed him to implement in the design of the building. We'll talk about lighting. We'll respond to some of the uh, correspondence that you received. Uh, we have a number of uh, letters of support that we'll submit for the record uh, and try to walk you through this. It's a complicated project. It has a lot of parts to it, and uh, we want you to have as, have as much time as you need to ask questions of our consultants, all of whom are here, uh, and we're ready to speak to those issues. So with that, we'll start with Corey, uh, who can walk us through some of the site plan elements. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. We're gonna make a switch of our computer system, if you don't mind. The screen saver is on it. It's a good sign. Okay. 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 
to stay up here and do it? Yeah, sure. Okay. It's a very light. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, it's. Just the same board. You want the lights off somewhere, maybe? I think it'd be maybe yeah. that would help. Yeah, I think it's not the light. It's not the light. Yeah. It's not the light. It's not the light. That's not the front. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Good evening. My name is Corey Garrow. I'm with the firm of uh, Close Jensen and Miller, <clears throat> and we are the site engineers for the property, also the um, surveyors as well. Uh, first, I'd like to go over a little bit what the existing conditions are, just to orient you. Um, the site is located in the uh, southeast corner of the intersection of Silas Dean Highway and Mill Street. It is bordered on the uh, north side by Silas Dean. It is bordered on the south side by Partial uh, Golf Brook. It is bordered, <coughs> excuse me, on the north side by 1160 uh, Silas Dean, and to the north of that is Mill Street. Uh, to the south side, there is a um, ra um, utility right away. As most of you know, the site um, has been abandoned for a long time, so things have, have started to deteriorate very much. Um, there's a 45,000 square foot building in the north portion of the site. It is surrounded by uh, pavement on the, on the west side, the south side, and the uh, east side. And it, it abuts, in a grass strip, it abuts the uh, next door building on the north side as well. There are two access points, both from the Silas Dean. They're uh, about 100, 150 feet apart. Um, when you first enter the site, you pretty much go down. The, the actual elevations at the upper parking are about four feet lower than the actual building because there's, there's uh, uh, docks and uh, walkways that bring you up above the flood zone. The entire site, except for the building, is within a floodplain. Anything below 29.1 is considered floodplain. And that pretty much encompasses most of the site except the building. There's also wetlands on the south side in this location and on the uh, east side in that location. Also, Golf Brook, as I said before, partially goes through the site. Um, it is served by all utilities. As far as sanitary, there's a lift station on site that's not been used for a very long time, so it's in a condition that can no longer be used. It's gotta be replaced. Um, as far as drainage goes, there's five different systems. One is within the DOT right away, and basically drains a couple of basins from the Silas Dean into the grass area and then out towards the Gulf Brook all within the DOT right away. Besides that, there's four uh, points where the uh, basins from the parking area uh, pick up all the drainage and uh, empty it into the Gulf Brook area. Um, there's a sidewalk that runs along the frontage and uh, basically that's it for the existing. <clears throat> the proposed site plan. As uh, Mr. Alter pointed out, uh, the new building uh, will be located as shown on the plan. You can see it's the sort of brown colored, pink shaped, pink pink looking building. Uh, it's an L shape, 
it's set further closer to Silas Dean Highway than the current building by approximately 40 feet. Uh, as you can see, uh, it... Uh, is it higher than the existing building? Not necessarily. The existing building, as I said before, is elevated above the flood zones. It's about elevation 32. The proposed building is about elevation 31. However, it sits closer to the size of the highway, which eliminates that dip down into the existing parking area. So you no longer see that. It's, it's, uh, the drives are much more in line with the elevations as the size of the highway. You're talking about the finished floor. Finished finish floor first 31, floor, right? Correct. Finished first floor? Yeah. Um, all the parking area, as you can see, has been put to the uh, southeast area behind the buildings, not visible at all from the uh, Sardine Highway. There are also two entrances proposed for this. The difference here being that they're only right, uh, right in and right out for both entrances. There's no access going south on the Sardine from these driveways. In order for anyone within the parcel to go south on the sizing, they will have to go out through what was previously described as an access easement through 1160 in this location. And this is also a full service intersection with Mill Street. Can we ask you questions or do you want to present? If you are afraid you may forget it, ask it now. <laughs> Let's wait. Yeah, let's wait. Yeah, well, the chairman usually says what he let's, likes. Let's, let's wait. Let's wait. Okay. We'll try and get through it all. We'll just try and get through it all. Right, right. Uh, there's also a sidewalk addition from the, from the sidewalk that runs along the Silas Dean into the site at this location, and that connects to the uh, surrounding sidewalks that go all the way around the building. Um, as was noted before, part, part of this proposal is a restaurant. In this, in this location will be an outdoor dining area, which is accessible from the front. Um, there's also a proposed dog park down here in the uh, southeast corner. And also, um, as you can see, we've also located all the uh, dumpster locations in the back. And by the way, these driveways, that there was a comment from, uh, I think, the town engineer, make sure that the driveways can accept not only service trucks, but also uh, fire trucks. But we've made these wide enough because we know there's gonna be a lot of people moving in and out for WB50s, which are moving trucks. So there's enough space in, in, uh, in the site and on these special design islands to be able to maneuver larger trucks in and out. Uh, we also have indicated a loading area in this location, which is off the travel path. This is the area where anybody moving in could locate their moving vehicles, anybody deliver, delivering uh, goods for the uh, retail or restaurant can park in this area. And they're serviced by a service corridor within this location inside the building. Uh, anything else here? The, uh, as I said before, the sanitary that's there today is obsolete, so we're going to be installing a new pump station in this location above the floodplain sitting on top. And there's also walls uh, built uh, proposed here in order to get back compensatory flood storage it was lost by, by putting the building in a new parking in there. So the site is actually, uh, as far as flood storage, matches the existing conditions. There's no, there's maybe about 10 to, 10 to 11 yards of additional storage, but that's kind of minor. Um, there's no well and impact at all. That's one reason why the walls are there as well. And it, it, it promotes creating a, a low area in this where any, any water quality uh, that we do on site will be further enhanced when it goes into this low area before it empties into Gulf Brook. Um, there is work 
proposed on Mill Street, as the uh, traffic engineer will perhaps touch upon later. The work on Mill Street is required in order to provide additional left, left turn lane for anybody going southbound. Since we can't go southbound from these two driveways, everybody's directed to this driveway to go south. That necessitated making the existing uh, turning lane, which is around 40 feet to about 175 feet. And we propose the grading on the north side of the, of the road because it makes more sense when you look at what's on the south side. There's a couple of, there's a utility line running on, the, on this side of Mill Street. Uh, and the poles are very close to the existing curb. And also, when you look at the shelf area between the curb and the sidewalk, it's very steep in that area. So any widening would, would, be, uh, would be very hard to do on that side. If you look on the, si on the north side of Mill Street, the shelf area is pretty flat and there's enough room to do two or three foot of winding at the most. So that made more sense to do that. <coughs> We're gonna go into drainage. Or grading, sure. Mm -hmm. We've, uh, the design of the drainage obviously follows the current standards for, for water quality as well as for, you know, type of design that we've, uh, that we've done that meets the, the town standards or state standards. There was, there's no qu water quality controls at all. Corey, could, could you go back? Well, I think you've got to go back one slide to show the drainage system. Back or forward one. I was going to do the grading first. Okay. So there's no water quality features at all on site. So we drain the site so that there's many locations where the, the low points are gonna be located. There's two in the front and there's three on the sides that are gonna be low points for picking up localized drainage. They all, the ones on the, on the north side carry the drainage down to this point here. And the ones on the north, on the, uh, on the west side of the building will have their own low points before the outlet back in the brook. There's five outlets today. We want to condense those to three. So we're going to eliminate two of the outlets and uh, only worry about three. The ones in the DOT, which we're not really touching, we're main basically maintaining the same pattern as there today. All we're doing is extending their outlet from where it is today at this location to go through the wall. That one, we do not, not have water quality. There's only two basins it's picking up. The rest of the system on the site will be treated with two hydrodynamic separators before the outlet into the brook. And the one on the, uh, on the north location, once it gets out of the outlet, it will have a long, flat, grassy area planted with native plants and water-resistant plants that will be able to enhance the water quality further. Um, is that, uh, um, yeah, I guess we touched them both anyway. Um, there's a lot of work within the DOT right of way and, uh, which includes the drives, the sidewalks, drainage, there's signing, <coughs> signing that guides people whether to enter or not to enter. There's landscaping, there's retaining walls, guide railing, fencing, a lot of work going on within the right of way. All this has to go before the state as far as this encroachment permit and also to the uh, OSTA for the traffic uh, administrative decision. So those items that are within the right of way will be reviewed not only by the town engineer but as well as the state. Uh, so I, I would, any, any comments that the deal, uh, the, your town engineer has made concerning what we need to do with some of the DOT items, I would defer that we sort of wait to see what the state has to um, come back with with comments before we can address them both. Um, as uh, Mr. Alter 
indicated, we've already approved, we've got approval from the inner wetlands for the floodplain and for the erosion controls. Um, we have received comments from the planner, your town engineer, and the fire marshal. Most of them are technical in nature. Uh, I do want to talk about one of the engineer's comment. He was talking about if we're going to be disturbing the entire site at once, he wants to see some kind of uh, sediment basin or sediment traps developed and all the drainage going towards that one spot. We feel that the way the site has been graded and the way the site is today, we think it makes more sense to break up the areas into smaller components of one acre or less to be able to control the water locally rather than driving it all into one spot. And when you look at the proposed grading, it makes sense to do that because, like I said before, we created low spots around the building, around the perimeter, which make it ideal to drain into those low spots, treat the water before it goes out into the brook. So that's one item that we'll be talking to your town engineer about. Uh, there's also comments from the fire marshal that he would like to see some more, a couple more hydrants in there, I think. <laughs> In his memo that he did in November, he indicated he was going to provide us the location. So we're aware of that. We just have not received that information yet from the, from the fire marshal. So I think I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Kevin Johnson to talk about landscaping. of the commission for the record Kevin Johnson close Jensen and Miller um, in terms of landscaping as you are all aware this site basically is devoid of any landscaping except for along the south side of the property and along the brook what this plan does is it not only preserves that green space area now I mean again we are regrading we're taking existing vegetation out doing enhancements, but generally it preserves that existing green space along the south side of the site, along the brook, creates a large expanse of green space along Silestine Highway, and creates numerous internal green space islands, not only on 1178 uh, Silestine Highway, but also on 1160. Uh, in general terms, uh, along Silestine Highway, uh, we do have some major street trees. Again, that large expanse of green. Uh, there's a sidewalk which runs along the front of the building. There's plantings, low evergreen plantings along that walk, as well as seasonal annuals. There is an outdoor eating patio for the restaurant, which is located at the northwest corner uh, of that building. Uh, around that patio, there's uh, several multi-stemmed uh, ornamental type trees to create a sense of space around that patio area as well as to provide some shading uh, for afternoon sun for patrons who are sitting and eating out in that area. Uh, internal landscaped islands generally uh, it's major deciduous trees uh, for the overhead canopy for the ground plane uh, it's numerous and different species of broadleaf evergreens, coniferous evergreen, ground cover uh, type plantings, generally lower than two feet within the parking areas. And again, species that will tolerate drought, heat, so forth, snow plows, um, or snow piled on top of the plantings. Uh, in the parking area on 1160, uh, entering from Mill Street uh, to 1178, We've enhanced that parking area as well by the creation of several landscaped islands. Again, similar treatment uh, of the tree canopy, the ground plane shrubs. Uh, what we tried to create there was, in effect, to, to create a type of alley, so a defined entrance uh, from as you move from Mill Street 
21178, uh, and that drive is purposely lined up with uh, a break in the building, uh, the front portion of the building in the rear. Uh, on the south side of the site, again, as I mentioned, uh, there's numerous invasive species. Um, there is an extensive regrading along uh, the parking area there to create the flood storage, uh, compensatory flood storage area, as well as the dog park and so forth. So when that regrading is done, we're adding numerous uh, ornamental trees, uh, such as amelanchiers, uh, river birches, uh, a lot of native species, uh, shrubs, uh, that will provide forage and cover and so forth for wildlife and small mammals that may be living uh, in that area. Uh, between 1178 and 1160, uh, again, we have numerous uh, major deciduous trees, a much broader canopy where we have larger areas, islands. Um, most of the trees within the internal islands, uh, we recognize just on the internal traffic patterns that there's going to be a lot of truck traffic, moving trucks and so forth, just based on the nature of this. Uh, so what I've chosen for a lot of those internal islands are tree species that are more fastidious, more columnar, that don't have a huge uh, overhead tree canopy, just to facilitate the movement of vehicles uh, through those parking areas. Uh, around the dumpster area uh, in the northeast corner of the parking lot, uh, not only do we have uh, PVC screening fence, but we also have fastidious uh, conifers, um, white pines. Uh, we have, as you can see on the plans, um, plant schedule, um, the maintenance schedule for the plantings. Uh, one thing I do want to point out to you, um, your set of plans that you received, um, they do not have the two trees in this one island. That they were inadvertently, it is on the PowerPoint presentation, but the packet that you did receive, those two trees were inadvertently left off. So I just uh, wanted to point that out because when I briefly go over the landscape waivers. Everybody knows. I was on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I go through the landscape waivers, <laughs> that's when you'll notice. Um, the other thing I do want to mention before I do the waivers is uh, seeding species along the brook. Uh, there's a couple different type of conservation mixes. Um, these mixes are intended to be a taller mix, uh, native, again, natives, mowed maybe once, twice a year. Um, the other areas, you know, between Silas Dean, the front of the building, uh, and around the periphery, the landscaped islands between 1178 and 1160 would be your typical mowed grass. I prefer fescue mixes. Uh, they're more drought tolerant. Um, they tolerate the heat better. So again, we, we've designed this plan to be in as much conformance as possible with your parking lot standards, design standards, your landscape standards. Um, there are several waivers um, which we do require. Um, on 1178, uh, perimeter landscaped areas uh, shall require an equivalent number of trees, one per 50 linear feet. Based on the overall perimeter, we would need 30 trees. We're proposing 20. Now, that's a tree that's uh, two and a half inches in caliper. Now, again, as I mentioned, we do have several or smaller ornamental trees, especially around the dog park, around the patio area. I did not include those. I mean, they technically <coughs> do not meet your regulation, but if you were to include those, you'd probably have more than 30 trees. But I asked for the waiver for 10 trees because it's not specific two and a half inch caliper. Um, the loading area. That loading area is located along the north side of the building. Uh, again, the regulations require that it be screened as much as possible. Um, Again, there's some minimal landscaping near the entrance of the restaurant, small trees and so forth, but certainly I'm not trying to claim that it's going to screen the loading, unloading area. Um, 
so that's why we're asking for that waiver for screening uh, the third one uh, parking area planting island should have an area of not less than 160 square feet and a width not less than eight feet uh, we have 10 islands that have an area less than 160 square feet and three islands with a width less than eight feet uh, item number four uh, unless modified by the commission uh, parking areas accommodating 10 or more cars shall provide landscape areas 15% uh, of the gross parking lot paved area uh, based on our overall parking area we have 10,137 square feet so the proposed landscape area would be 5,343 so we're asking for a waiver of 4,794 square feet um, but again in considering that waiver I again ask you to take into consideration what we are creating versus what's existing on that site today um, number five uh, wherever possible each island median uh, peninsula shall at a minimum contain at least one tree and this island here is the one island that does not have a tree and the reason I pointed this out was originally the carports extended between those two end islands. Uh, so we did not have trees at either end because of the supports for the carports as well as shading concerns. Um, so when that was modified, the carports, that freed up that other island for the two trees. So hence there's just one island uh, that has no trees. Uh, on 1160 Silestine Highway, and again, this waiver only pertains to the area that we're modifying, so it's not the entire site. It's just along that driveway that's defined by that cross hatching. Uh, again, it's the regulation for 160 square feet and 8 feet wide. Um, we have two islands with an area less than 160 square feet. So we're asking for a waiver for island area. So uh, at this point, I think that concludes my comments on landscaping. Uh, good evening. I'm Mark Fertucci. I'm a senior transportation engineer at Fossen O'Neill. Uh, I'm also a registered professional engineer and professional traffic uh, operations engineer as well. Uh, we did prepare the traffic impact study for the development. We also prepared a, a separate letter uh, that had our uh, shared parking analysis in it as well. And I just want to uh, describe uh, the findings of those studies for you uh, here tonight. Uh, just uh, quickly to uh, orient you to the site again. Uh, <coughs> the site is located uh, off on the, uh, the southeast corner of the uh, Silestine Highway and the Mill Street um, intersection. Uh, as you can see up on the, uh, on the aerial, uh, Mill Street runs uh, east-west uh, across our study area and uh, intersects off to the east with Middletown Avenue. So as part of our traffic study, we did uh, review uh, traffic operations at uh, the intersections of Silestine and Mill, Mill at Middletown Avenue. We also reviewed uh, the existing uh, driveway, which is at 1160 Silestine, which is the driveway we're uh, proposed to share access with. Uh, and that uh, driveway is opposite uh, a driveway to the plaza, which uh, I'll call it the Marshalls uh, Plaza uh, for ease, but I think the actual number is, uh, I forget the actual number, well, 1142 Silestine Highway. <laughs> we'll call it Marshalls. <coughs> um, so as part of our traffic study, we, um, we did conduct uh, turning movement traffic counts at each of our study area intersections. We, we counted them. Uh, kind of the intersections in the morning and afternoon peak hours of traffic. Uh, and the count data indicated those, those peak hours were 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. in the morning, uh, 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon. So those were the hours we, uh, we analyzed for impacts of this development. Uh, we did uh, uh, 
check with the uh, Department of Transportation, their, their planning bureau, um, because we were uh, growing these counts out to the 2018 design year for when we uh, expect that this development will be uh, constructed. Um, however, the DOT indicated that uh, there hasn't been substantial traffic growth in this area, so uh, we did not use a growth factor to grow those uh, counts out uh, a year. They indicated the 2017 counts would be uh, sufficient for use in the study. I did want to point out, um, as far as background traffic conditions go, uh, there is a proposed project that the state of Connecticut is completing at the intersection of the Silas Dean Highway and Mill Street. It is a complete uh, traffic signal replacement. Uh, there's the new signal at that intersection um, is going to include uh, side street left turn phasing. Um, so that will actually help uh, the operations uh, at that intersection. Currently, there's no left turn arrow. Uh, for traffic on, on Mill Street. Um, <coughs> so those, uh, those operations will improve um, and, and to help, uh, help the traffic get out of Mill Street a little better, that will also uh, not only make it easier for traffic for the development, but just also for the background traffic on the roadway uh, as well. Uh, looking at are the- they put, uh, the Are they putting in the uh, a, a two lane approach or is it just a left turn advance? Uh, it's a left turn advance. Uh, there is a two lane approach there today, um, but the turn lane, the left turn lane is only 50 feet long, yeah. 40 to 50 feet long. Yeah. Um, that, as I'll and mention no, in a minute, we're, we're proposing to extend that because it, yeah, right. the queue over spills the storage lane. Okay, sorry. Um, so proposed conditions uh, uh, for the development, the, um, um, <clears throat> as was discussed earlier, um, and I'll, I'll get into more of the parking when I, when I talk about the shared parking analysis, but we, we have 164 uh, new parking spaces which are proposed on the 1178 site. There's 117 spaces which will remain on the 1160 uh, Silas Dean site. Um, so combined, um, we'll have, uh, that's uh, 281 uh, total parking spaces which will be shared. Uh, the parking lots will be interconnected, and the site access, um, if I go back a few slides here, uh, site access again will be via two right-in, right-out driveways uh, on the Silas Dean Highway. Uh, we had recommended that, that left-turning traffic not be uh, permitted to, to leave the site and to enter the site given the width of the Silas Dean Highway's five lanes and it would be very difficult uh, to make that, those left turn maneuvers, which is, which is why we went with the right in, right out. Uh, and then you have the shared driveway at the 1160 uh, driveway to Mill Street, which that will be full access uh, to allow for um, anyone coming from the uh, north on the Silas Dean Highway can't turn left in, they'll be able to go in via Mill Street and uh, vice versa to exit southbound on the Silas Dean from the site. Um, so, uh, again, for the proposed development, um, we have a couple of uses within the site. We have the 111 residential units proposed, but we also have a restaurant use. Uh, we have a small retail component, which is going to include a hair salon. <coughs> and um, so what we did is uh, to determine the traffic generation from this development. We uh, looked at each land use and utilized rates provided in the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual which is an industry <coughs> accepted resource for determining uh, traffic generation. What the IT manual indicated is when you take the traffic uh, projected rates from each of those uses, uh, the site will generate 61 trips in the morning peak hour of traffic, and 201 trips in the afternoon peak hour of traffic. <coughs> I did want to note we did not take any credits on those trips for um, internal capture use. This is you know, people who may, a resident who may use the restaurant or the hair salon on site, you know, they wouldn't really generate a trip uh, because they're already on the site. We didn't take any credit for that, nor did we take credit for pass-by traffic on the Silas Dean Highway that may, you know, stop in the site into the retail use and then continue on. So I, I would consider those trip generation rates uh, conservative. 
So what we did is uh, <coughs> we took our existing traffic, uh, background traffic volumes, we added in the site generated traffic to determine the combined or build condition traffic uh, uh, volumes with the, uh, with the uh, proposed development in place. <coughs> so we took those volumes and we then conducted a capacity analysis at each of our study area intersections uh, to determine the operation of those intersections, comparing the operation uh, before and after the development is constructed. Each of those intersections, when we, when we conduct an analysis, uh, is rated based on a level of service. Uh, level of service is a report card type scale of A to F, uh, with A indicating a condition of a very low delay and efficient operations. A level of service F is a, is a condition of significant delay and higher uh, driver frustration. What we found uh, is the intersection of uh, the Silas Dean uh, Highway at Mill Street uh, will operate um, at, can actually currently operates at, at an efficient level of service uh, B in the morning peak hour and C in the afternoon peak hour. There is no projected decrease in level of service at that intersection <coughs> as a result of the proposed development traffic. Uh, similarly, at the intersection of um, Middletown Avenue at Mill Street, uh, that intersection operates in the peak hours uh, efficiently at level service A or B. We have no reduction in level of service there either. And at the, uh, the site driveway intersection, the shared 1160 site driveway intersection, the approach to Mill Street uh, will experience uh, a decrease in level of service from B to C uh, as a result of the additional traffic, but level of service C uh, still uh, an acceptable and efficient level of service for traffic that will be exiting the site. <coughs> the turns into the site driveway from Mill Street will operate efficiently at level service A. We also looked at vehicle queues. Uh, there were no significant queue increases projected at any of the study area intersections. We had a maximum queue increase of, of uh, two vehicles, uh, two vehicle lengths. However, I did want to note um, uh, two things, uh, uh, or one issue that we did we did find, as I had mentioned, uh, alluded to before, the existing left turn lane on Mill Street, the westbound left turn lane approach to the Silas Dean Highway, currently only 40 to 50 feet long, and uh, the our field observations and the analysis indicated that Q overspills that storage uh, quite significantly, <coughs> and we're adding uh, about two vehicle lengths to that Q as a result of the proposed development traffic. So uh, as Corey mentioned, we're proposing to lengthen that turn lane to 175 feet. It will require about two to three feet of widening on the north side of Mill Street. Uh, and with that uh, extended turn lane, the queues at the intersection will be contained within the turn lane and they're not projected to back up to the uh, 1160 and Marshall's uh, site driveway intersection. Uh, lastly, as part of the traffic study, we did, re, uh, we did conduct a safety analysis. Uh, we looked at intersection site distances from each of the proposed site driveways. All three of them, uh, the site distance provided exceeds a DOT criteria for safe egress. We also reviewed crash data at each of the study intersections, and the crash data review revealed there were no abnormal crash patterns or frequencies uh, within the study area. So the conclusions of our traffic study um, are that the uh, proposed development will not have a significant impact to traffic operations within uh, the study area. And this is predicated, again, on the two uh, off-site improvements that are uh, proposed to take place this year, the, the DOT traffic signal improvement, which I mentioned, and also uh, the improvement to the left turn lane, uh, which the applicant will be, uh, will be constructing. Uh, I did want to mention uh, as well this uh, project will warrant uh, review by the State Office of the State Traffic Administration. It will require an administrative decision review uh, given it meets the thresholds uh, for, uh, for parking and square footage. Uh, so that, <coughs> uh, should the town approve this, we would uh, submit next to the state. Uh, it will also require an encroachment permit from the DOT District 1 office for the uh, proposed curb cuts on, uh, within the Route 99 Silas Dean right-of-way. Uh, moving on to our shared parking analysis, 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, we have a total of 281 uh, parking spaces that will be available for use uh, for this site um, combined with the existing 1160 Silas Dean site. Uh, 164 spaces will be constructed on 1178 Silas Dean. That will be in addition to the 117 spaces that will uh, remain on the 1160 Silas Dean parcel. So as part of the study, we did look, um, we look at the parking requirements uh, for the town of Weathersfield for, uh, for what would be required for the uses proposed on the site. Um, zoning would require 1.5 units for residential, well, spaces per unit, five spaces per thousand square feet for retail, and one space per, per three uh, table seats for restaurants. So that would yield uh, if you were to assume no shared parking at all, that would yield 251 parking spaces required for 1178 Silas Dean. But we then we, we looked at the 1160 Silas Dean parcel, and with this site, we have the benefit of it being open and operational. Uh, it's got some office and medical office use so, uh, that's operating today, so we were able to actually go out and count uh, the parking utilization that's actually occurring on that site. And we conducted those counts on Wednesday, November 16th, which uh, we were advised as a normal operating day for the development. And what we did is, uh, what we found when we uh, conducted the counts uh, were that uh, you know, the, the parking lot was, was fairly significantly underutilized. Um, there was never at any point in the day was the lot uh, more than half full. Um, we saw with the peak demand of the parking lot, as you might expect with a, an office uh, type use, was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and at that point we still had 70 spaces that were vacant. Um, so we actually, um, we actually checked the vacancy of the building at the day of the counts. It was about 14 percent vacant, so we took that into account as well and, and bumped those numbers up in our, in our parking analysis. So we know what's required for 1178 now, we know what's required for 1160, so we then went ahead and we did our shared parking analysis and the, the basis, uh, the t fundamental tenet of this analysis really is that uh, the uses on the 1178 site and on the 1160 site are complementary. They don't all generate a peak parking demand at the same time during the day. Uh, the residents will generate overnight uh, uh, parking demand and the office will generate a peak demand during the afternoon. The restaurant more so in the early evening or at the lunch hours. So they're all generating at different times of the day. So the Urban Land Institute has methodology for a shared parking analysis, where, which is what we used here in this study. We looked at each hour throughout the day and what the projected demand of each use on site was uh, for that hour of the day and came up with a cumulative shared parking demand for each hour of the day for the, for the combined sites. And uh, that's table three of our uh, parking letter, um, if, you're, if you're looking at it. So what we found is um, going down that table and looking at every hour of the day, the peak overall shared demand for the site was 250 spaces. That occurs early in the afternoon and, and about the 1 to 2 o'clock uh, peak hour. We have a total, as I mentioned, of 281 parking spaces uh, that will be uh, available on the two sites. So if you, uh, you do the net, the net math there, we actually have a surplus of 24 uh, spaces that, that uh, would be vacant, that's at the projected highest uh, hour, uh, peak hour demand uh, throughout the day. So we are confident in doing this um, analysis that the parking provided, the shared parking provided on both of the sites uh, will be sufficient to accommodate uh, the parking demand. And I wanted to make one other note as well. Um, we the rates, uh, the hourly demand that we use for the, uh, for the residences, if you look at that table, uh, they are very conservative. The ULI methodology is conservative with respect to those residential uh, parking demand rates during the day. Uh, I've done several of these parking studies in the south end of Stanford, and we've actually gone out and done counts to check the numbers, and we found that the vacancy of the residential spaces during the day is actually 
much higher than what the ULI methodology would propose. Uh, ULI says anywhere from 60 to 70 percent are still occupied during the day, but we're finding people are away at work. Um, they're more vacant than that. So uh, it just further gives me the confidence that this analysis is, is conservative. Um, I'm sure you have questions, but we'll hold those to the end, and I'm going to turn it over right now to uh, Matt, who's going to talk about the architecture. Thanks. Thank you. For the record, my name is Matthew Koenig. I'm a principal at Barton Partners, and I'm the architect and designer for this project. Um, there was a lot of technical information thrown at you over the last hour, and I just really feel special because I get to do the fun part of the project, and I'm glad my consultants get to do all the technical stuff because it would drive, it would drive me crazy, but they do a great job, and we really appreciate all that they do. Um, I just kind of wanted to discuss the design that we presented the last time um, really hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, we made some minor changes based on some of the comments that were presented and I just want to kind of quickly walk you through what some of those changes are. Um, but before I do that, I, I do want to remind everybody that as part of the guidelines and the vision plan, those are the things that we looked at in the beginning of this project to form and shape this building. Um, there was, there was a whole goal about providing some additional density on this site, proposing a mixed use building, which we have. We have the uses of retail and we have the multifamily aspect. Um, and with that came a contemporary design. Um, we're gonna walk you through about five or six different slides that show how this building fits along Silas Dean Highway. Um, and for, as an architect, this is kind of a really unique opportunity for us. Um, we almost feel there's absolutely no context for this site. Um, other than the office building that's our next door neighbor, we really don't have anything that we can draw um, any kind of real design features from. If you go up and down the, the highway, um, there's every color brick, there's every shape of roof, whether it's pitched or flat. I mean, you have every use possible. You have some old apartment buildings that were built in the 40s and 50s, you have some new retail that's been created, but it, it's a real hodgepodge of stuff. So for us, it was kind of a unique opportunity. And one of the things that Marty charged our firm with was to create a destination, create a place that could um, really be remarkable, be memorable, be something that could draw people. And uh, um, I think Mark had thrown up one of the site plans during his traffic study that showed the amount of neighboring uses that surround this site, which as somebody who's coming here to rent an apartment, um, I think it, those, those are some of the real amenities to this location. You have every type of restaurant, you have every type of retail, you have so many things that make this site desirable. Um, and one of the things that we do when we look at sites is we say, well, what's the draw? What's gonna bring people here? And these are the type of amenities that draw people. Um, Going into that contemporary design, there were certain features that the design guidelines required. Um, they were looking for a relatively taller building, anywhere from one to eight stories, and our project presents a five-story building. We're using flat roofs, um, which also helps promote the kind of the contemporary look of this building. Um, they talked about using durable materials, and we're using a broad range of durable materials, and I'll walk everybody through that in a second. Um, the use of neutral colors. We are using a predominant uh, palette of neutral colors that also helps promote the contemporary design. Um, and they also wanted the building to be very pedestrian friendly. And those are one of the things that we've done, one of the small changes that we've made to make this building a little bit more pedestrian friendly. And uh, we'll walk you through that in a second. Um, okay. So this is one of the perspectives of the building um, from the northwest corner. 
at one of the entry points. Um, and not much has changed from the last time we presented this building. It still has the same shape and form. We still have the retail that runs along the face of Silas Dean Highway. Um, towards the back of the L is the main residential lobby, um, which comes down past this entry drive, which is seen in this view. Um, so um, we were asked to present some slides that showed the building in its context along the, the highway. So this is a view looking south. Um, and you can kind of really see that there's, there's not a whole lot um, to really draw. You have the, the trees that separated from the bank building that's further down the road, but you really don't see a whole lot of that. Um, building's kind of a little bit on an island. There's, like I said, not, not much context to tie it into. Um, this is a close-up of the building, a uh, similar view, and just a couple things that we'd like to talk about is the, um, the way that the building and the massing and the form have been developed. Um, there's a very strong base, that's the retail. Um, above that is one of the, the design guidelines was talking about creating a signage band. Um, in order to allow cars and vehicles to drive through this building to get to the rear parking, we have to create a 14 foot high space that would allow a fire truck to get through. So our first floor is set at roughly 16.6 to where our second floor starts. Um, within that 16.6 6 space is this very dramatic sign band that wraps around the building and ties the retail into the project. Um, and that's one of the things, they wanted the sign band, I think it was in that 12 foot range. So we're a little bit higher, but it still presents a very strong base and then the four stories of residential sit on top of that. Um, this is a view of the southwest corner of the building that shows the entrance through the building that takes you towards the rear parking area. You can see on this front facade the, um, the, some, of the, some of the use of different colors um, and there's really a range of metal panels. There's some grays, there's some tans. There's a panel that's the, the wood color on that building which is a Trespa panel which I'll describe in a second. Um, that provides a little bit of an accent color. Here's the, roughly the same view looking towards the north where you can see the office building next door. And you can see how the building sits within the context. Um, it's relatively the same height as that building. Um, and so it's not really out of place. Um, we, as the civil engineers had talked about, we did bring the building forward a little bit. Um, we removed all of the parking that was in front of the building, so it does create kind of a dramatic setback. So one of the, the minor changes that we talked about from the last time, this is a view, an area looking down at the building, and we've added a roof deck um, as one of the amenity features. So this roof deck um, comes out of the main elevator core. It's roughly about 1,200, 1,500 square feet of space up top. You can see the mechanical units that are planned for the building. There's a whole series of condenser units that we're gonna locate towards the center of the building. Um, and they wrap around um, to be convenient to the location of the units, but they also tie into some of the egress paths that we have to provide for emergency off of that roof. Um, on the south side of this roof, which we currently do not show, we are planning on trying to install some solar panels. Um, one of Marty's goals here is to provide some solar energy opportunities within the parking and the roof as well. Getting a little bit into the materials, these are, we're going to walk through some of the facades. And this is where you can kind of see the, the neutral color palette that we're proposing. Um, the, when we did the presentation to the Architectural Review Board, there were some questions about the materials, and I think the big question was this Trespa material. Um, it's indicated right here on our materials board, and it is all the areas that show up orange or have the wood grain pattern to it. The Trespa panel is a composite panel. Um, it comes in sheets. It could be cut like any hardwood material. Trespa has been around for 55 years. Um, it's extremely durable. It's color true, so it's not going to fade. Um, and it basically it comes in a broad range of colors. It's fire retardant. Um, we really like it because it does bring a little bit more of the contemporary flair to the building. 
the, the predominant material on the facade at the corners is, a, um, is an architectural designer block. Um, it's not split place, it's a smooth face block. It lays up like a masonry, like a larger block would. Um, in the center of the building, there's a couple different smooth face metal panels. Um, and then on the back of the building, um, we're looking at doing some fiber cement materials that matches the pattern and tone of what's presented on the front, which is the, the Silas Dean exposure. This is the left elevation on Mill Street. It's the same palette of materials that wrap around the side. Um, you can see the retail at the bottom with the, the glass storefronts. Towards the, the middle of the building is where you actually get into some of the residential uses on the ground floor. Inside there, there's some mechanical spaces, but there's also some amenities in there. There's a screening room, there's a fitness center. Um, there is a, uh, there's kind of a hole that happens midway between the retail and the amenity space and that's an internal breezeway which we've added to provide access from the rear parking lot so that if people want to get to the retail tenants on the front they can cut through the building um, in this area um, i can show you here this is where the breezeway and service corridor connect um, at the architectural review meeting there was some concern that that area would be dark and not properly lit, which we always had the intentions of lighting it. It would be very open and friendly, but we've also added some additional windows in our fitness center that occur in this location, so there could be some more eyes into that space. Um, and we also did talk about presenting, presenting some um, shadow boxes for the retailers to actually advertise in there to the tenants. So we're gonna try to animate that as much as possible and make it user friendly. The rear elevation and the right side elevation. The same color palette, same materials spread around all four sides. Um, just quickly running through the mix, this is something that um, is a minor change from the last time we presented. I think the last time we were here, we presented 120 units. Um, we took a look at this and actually reduced the density slightly. So what we're presenting today is down to 111 units. Um, Part of that was looking for increased amenity space. Um, we eliminated a unit on the fifth floor to create a club room on the upper level. Um, but we also just kind of looked, we shortened the building a little bit um, to reduce the, the scale of it. Um, so currently the mix is 12 studios, 63 one bedroom units, 32 two bedrooms, and four three bedrooms. Um, and if you look at that breakdown, that's pretty common with most residential buildings of this size and scale that we're seeing. So this, this is the first floor plan, which was kind of a, a, a derivative of what I just showed you, but you can kind of see those two, um, two little service corridors in between the retail and the amenity space. The amenity shows up as purple. The retail is showing up as kind of a pink or orange color. Um, I think in Mark's slide, that retail was, was slightly higher. The restaurant space is only 4,800 square feet. There's roughly 11,000 square feet of uh, retail space. And uh, um, right now, like I said, it's, we're positioning a, a, res, a restaurant tenant for that corner. Um, proposed restaurant? Proposed, exactly. Um, so just a handful of slides that show some of the interiors. These are some typical clubhouse photos and images from other buildings we've designed with Marty. So, um, which give you a sense of just the, the quality and, and some of the features that are gonna be inside the building. Um, fitness centers, which are fairly typical. Um, we have roughly a thousand square foot fitness center planned. Um, Concierge package system. This is something that's evolving on the multifamily side. Um, obviously, everybody is ordering online and having packages delivered at their house. Well, the same things are happening in our multifamily buildings. The small mail room that we used to have is pretty much doubled or tripled in size because everybody's ordering. So these concierge package systems are really hot. These things are really popular. So we, we're increasing the opportunities Where's for that. that? Located? So that's in the, uh, it's in the ground floor lobby space. Oh, yeah, no, 
So when you come in through the front door, it's not shown here, there's a mail room and right behind it is the package holding room. That's what all that gray area is. Yeah, exactly. Activities, common activities for the residents. Correct. Yep. Um, so some of the other site amenity, amenities that we're looking at doing, um, car charging stations. Um, you can see the rooftop amenity down in the lower right corner. The solar covered parking um, is something that we're trying to do in the parking lot area. And then Marty has been introduced these uh, bike share stations, which he has at the tannery, he has at Windsor Station. So again, just another way to uh, promote some of the pedestrian and uh, you know reduce the amount of car traffic that you need. What are you going to use the solar roof for, other than to protect the cars? You're going to actually produce solar electricity. Yes. Correct. Yes. So it's this the slide that shows a typical dog park, which we have planned on the site. Um, it'll be fenced in. It'll be well maintained. Um, again, if, if anybody is, you know, renting apartments, providing, you know, more amenities and activities for pets is a huge draw. These are just some simple slides showing the uh, interior of a typical apartment unit. Some of the finishes, just to show the level of quality that we're proposing here. Thank you. Some other matters uh, on the lighting plan. Uh, we've presented a lighting plan that uh, demonstrates that with the exception of the north side of the property, uh, there is no spillage of light off of the site. We are asking for a waiver on the north side, since we uh, are directly adjacent to another parking lot, it would not be possible to uh, have both parking lots appropriately lit uh, without having some light spillage uh, cross over that line. So one of the waivers that we're asking for is relief just on the north northerly boundary uh, with respect to lighting. Otherwise, the lighting plan fully complies with the regulations expectations uh, we've shown you the types of fixtures that we propose to use uh, both within the parking lot and for bollard lighting uh, around the site uh, all is uh, is shown on the lighting plan that we submitted as part of our application materials um, approved by design review the lighting plan was presented to DREC yes Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, the uh, there is some correspondence that that you received. I need uh, Dean's letter. Um, one letter uh, was sent to the commission from an interested uh, naturalist um, regarding potential conflicts with uh, small mammals and birds. Uh, it was only, the letter was signed Allison L, so I really don't know exactly who that was, but uh, Dean Gustus, Gustafson of All Points Technology Corporation, who was our uh, resource and consultant for our wetlands application, reviewed that letter and provided a, a very comprehensive response uh, speaking to uh, a number of comments that were made. Um, according to the comment letter, there appears to be an active kill deer nest on the ground in the front of the subject property building. Kill deer is not a listed rare species either under State of Connecticut or Federal Endangerment Endangered Species Acts. However, killdeer is afforded protection under the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act. This protection also includes active nest, that is, that contains either eggs or nest-dependent young from disturbance or harassment. As a result, no disturbance to, to the active nest could occur without a permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He goes on to describe that the nesting period is typically in April in Connecticut so that construction activities that occurred, for example, after 
the beginning of July would not cause a disturbance to uh, such a nest or protected bird. Um, and, and we would ask Mr. Gustafson to come to the site and make a review before we commenced activities, since the first activity will be to raise the building. He also indicates that um, the, the nature of the animals found in the Gulf Brook wetland area that she described are typical of urban sites where uh, animals learn to cohabit with uh, a high level of human activity that he suspects that while construction is underway activity and noise may in some ways drive those animals further into the Gulf Brook wetland towards the Connecticut River uh, but at the end of the construction when everything is stabilized it is likely that to the extent they choose to return uh, they, they will be able to and have no more disturbance than they currently have. And we'll submit um, the entire letter uh, into <coughs> the record so that um, people will be aware of it. In addition, um, Mr. Kenny and, and our office have received uh, a rather staggering, frankly, number of letters in support uh, of this application. I think at the last count there was 55 letters uh, from Weathersfield residents. I'm not going to go into all of them, but to say that they are unanimous in their support of the project is an accurate representation of what they say. Uh, there is a widespread uh, expression of appreciation for the fact that a building that has been uh, left wanting for a great number of years can now be developed into something uh, very, very productive and iconic uh, on the Silestine Highway. With that, uh, and in summary, what I would say is that uh, with the granting of the waivers that we've mentioned and <coughs> outlined in our application, and a review of all of the materials that we've submitted, we believe that we fully conform to the regulations that are established for this zone and for this mixed use. Um, we've presented you with a lot of material. Um, as Mr. Garrow said, uh, we did have a chance to review the comments from staff. Most of them were technical in nature and can be easily addressed. Uh, through uh, some plan changes to speak to those. Um, but in, uh, in, in all other ways, we feel that you have before you a very comprehensive application supported by a great amount of material, uh, all in evidence of the fact that we comply with the regulations. Uh, we would ask you to approve this uh, special permit and the plan for development that Lexington Partners has put forward. All of our consultants are here, ready to answer questions or speak to comments uh, that may be made as part of the public hearing or that the commission has. Thank you for your time. <coughs> and if uh, somebody needs a particular slide, we can put that back up for frame of reference. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, so we have a bunch of correspondence that I could identify for the record, but quite honestly, um, I want to hurry up and get kind of to the public comment, but I do want to get some thoughts from us first. So why don't we all try and contain our questions to, you know, some period of 15 minutes or so. I've done and it up we'll, till now, Mr. Chairman. So well, if we, if we, you know, hit a few, hit a few top to questions that are, uh, <laughs> that are sitting on the, your lips, and then we'll move to the public. Um, George, you, and, and I will, yes, go ahead. I was just gonna ask for comments from Peter Gillespie and focusing on his 19 bullets as well as the engineer's 42 bullets. And okay, we could do, we could do that first, all right. Um, they do add some context. And also, the way the presentation was given to us, uh, it was kind of given to us in, in a site civil 
and then landscaping and traffic and then architectural. So as we do our 15 minutes of questions, let's try and keep them so that only one person comes up and we'll try and get through this. So Peter, you had a piece of correspondence. Could you summarize it? Is there something that uh, you want to bring forward for us? <clears throat> Certainly. Um, you do have a copy of my May 12th uh, correspondence. Uh, in essence, I attempted to summarize the proposal and then at the end uh, there were a series of sort of staff comments, uh, technical issues that we felt still needed to be addressed. Um, one of the more important things for you to look closely at is the shared parking analysis and the shared parking uh, proposed agreement. Um, you did receive uh, some commentary from the town attorney uh, just today, so he did have the opportunity uh, to review the both the analysis and the uh, <coughs> actual agreement. He had some uh, minor comments, but I think he his main, main point was that um, we need to be mindful that the uh, occupancy of 1160 could technically change into the future, and that might uh, impact some of the basic assumptions and the analysis. So I think uh, at the end of, of this process, as you uh, discuss uh, proposed conditions, we may want to uh, add some language in, in that regarding those assumptions, and if those assumptions change, that there uh, might need to be opportunities to continue to monitor the situation and review uh, any proposed uh, occupancy of the building that might change in the future. Uh, uh, the bank, I believe, uh, is probably leaving the space at some point in the future, so that would create an occupancy uh, opportunity for somebody else. So I, I, so I think that's a, 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 a certainly a, a dialogue that we need to have, and you also have to, I think, make sure you, you understand uh, and, uh, the actual assumptions that are being made in the, in the shared parking analysis. So the shared parking analysis is certainly a, a big topic. Um, <clears throat> There's also a little bit of, uh, th there are gonna be multiple players in the proposed traffic improvements. As you heard in the presentation, the DOT is going to be redoing the light. So that's their responsibility. The developer is going to uh, be widening Mill Street. And then just to further complicate that, although it wasn't mentioned in the presentation, uh, the MDC is proposing to do significant work on Mill Street in the, in the intervening time frame. Uh, and the town apparently as part of that proposal may be overlaying and repaving Mill Street. So I think we need to... I'm sure you'll do yours first and then... then yes, yes. So, exactly there, right? I thought that was required. That you yes. Right so, so, so we need to, you know, so there are many moving targets on that. So I think it, once again at the end of the day we need to be uh, understanding who's doing what, when and where. Um, there are a number of waivers and modifications. Uh, I, I'm not uncomfortable with any of them. I mean, this is a redevelopment uh, site. Uh, obviously, the existing conditions speak for themselves. Uh, uh, this is a dramatic improvement to what exists there. So I, I really, none of, none of the waivers or modifications regarding the density, the landscaping, or any of those things are, are bothersome to me. But just, once again, uh, make sure uh, at the end of the day. You understand all of those and they're part of the uh, proposed uh, motion. Uh, the bulk of my memo in, in essence summarizes what is being proposed. Uh, there, there are, they are proposing sto storm water management quality improvements, so we're very supportive of that given the proximity of the site to the Gulf Brook. There, there are some issues that I think the town engineer st still needs to wrap his head around, so th once again, there are technical, uh, technical in issues there. Uh, and then at the end of my memo, there are a series of 18 or 19, 19 um, comments. Uh, I don't. I don't think any of them are, are deal breakers and we just wait, uh, we will await responses to our comments from uh, whether it's the architect or whether it's the site engineer. So I think um, none of those uh, are unresolvable um, at this point in time. Right. And from what I can see of uh, the town engineer's memo, which is dated yesterday and we just received it today, but obviously the applicant saw it probably yesterday as well. Um, and I think, uh, Corey mentioned it that uh, there were no deal breakers there. That kind That's of correct. thing. Okay. So, unless unless you want something more, we'll leave that. All right. So, questions, and then wh whoever wants to start, let's all try and glom on to the topics. 
No, no, we'll, we'll do some of our own questions if they, okay? I want to kind of set the stage. I mean, if you care, I, I'll, I'll start if you want to, Go ahead. All right? I know it would be different. But I had some questions about the, the traffic. <coughs> um, so maybe we can, welcome back. So um, I'm a little surprised you've waited this long to coordinate with the OSTA and DOT process. Um, we often see a dialogue take place before you're here, but I agree completely that we should be having, and I'm sure the town engineer agrees too, before you resolve those final questions, you gotta, add, you gotta bring this third party into the conversation and uh, find out what they're gonna be looking for. Um, in terms of the access drives, the one that bothers me most, and I assume others as well, is the exit drive. There's only one place to exit two, two parcels now, and that's the Mill Street um, location. So w when I look at your report, it looks like that's the, that's that driveway heading in a northbound direction is the one that has a level of service. See, it's the worst approach and any of the four approaches to that unsignalized intersection. And I'm trying to validate by going through the charts that the number coming out is going to be roughly 100 vehicles, roughly 100 and 120. Um, I want to make sure that because when I look at the chart, I'm not sure I'm seeing it, that you have included the 1160 exiting volumes. I, you know, there's a chart in here. <clears throat> it's table one, appendix A. Mm -hmm. And there are three afternoon peak hour counts that roughly come up to something less than 100, but I don't see a 1160 exiting number. And I will just go like this and say it's gotta be at least 20 because it's the afternoon, it's a commercial building, it's got 70 parking spaces in there, and that's, you know, that's what you found anyways, right? And I'm gonna right. guess that a quarter of them are leaving all at that last hour. So 120 people are trying to leave there in an hour. That's not the end of the world, but you're not meeting a warrant requirement, are you? I no, assume you're no. not. No, a current, uh, if you look at figure three uh, in the traffic study, that's the, uh, the background traffic volumes. So leaving the 1160 driveway uh, help today. Me with, help me with a page. Uh, it's not a page number, it's in okay. Appendix B. Appendix B, thank you. Appendix B in figure three. <laughs> Um, so there's, if you look at site driveway one, that's that's the 1160 Silas Dean uh, driveway. So today it's got uh, nine vehicles that exit in the morning peak hour, and 20 and 10 and five is 35 vehicles that exit in the afternoon peak hour. Uh, and then if you if you go ahead to um, if you flip to figure five, this is the additional traffic that will be added to that uh, driveway approach from the 1178 site. So we're adding about 28 vehicles in the morning peak hour and 61 vehicles in the afternoon peak hour. And then if you flip to figure six, you got the, you got the combined. Uh, so the total traffic coming out of there uh, in the morning peak hour is about 37 trips and then in the afternoon you've got uh, just under a hundred, got 96, 96 vehicles exiting there. So as I said, that's a level of service C, uh, operation exiting, uh, the site. So that's, that's an acceptable, um, operation. It, there is, uh, I want to say five to 10 additional seconds of delay for vehicles exiting the site. Once you add the, uh, the, the 1178 traffic to it, um, the 95th percentile queue is about two vehicle lengths sure. uh, leaving the site. So that's, that's your exit point um, for, obviously, for anyone going left or southbound on the Silas Dean, you go through there. But you can exit, and you can go right and northbound on the Silas Dean, right, right out of the right, out, right in, right out fair, driveways. Fair enough. Good point. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> As a former DOT person, that's what I'm interested in is, your, <laughs> I, is, is what's going to happen sure. when you go for your permit stuff. Um, oh, question of traffic, you go ahead, please. Uh, so real quick, so on the spaces, 
for the 11.60s. So you observed um, the traffic count take at 3 p.m. There were seven <coughs> cases uh, occupied. Correct, so right. We, again, you're asking us to accept, looks like 400, one space per 400 square feet, almost double the criteria for our code. But I guess one step further is that the it's 14% vacant. So you're as, asking us, you're jumping in further, saying that the empty space, when fully utilized, will be at that same rate. And so that's a, that's a conclusion that I'm not sure how you jump to that conclusion. What, what, it's what, what, so that the code that we're required for this office type. So, so table two is what we actually counted, uh, and if you're looking in our parking analysis. Uh, on table four, we've, we've taken into account the 14% vacancy, so we've actually bumped those numbers up. We've bumped those uh, the utilized spaces the up. But at what rate? Same rate, the same rate that it's actually Same rate generating. that it's generating today, so right. How do you know that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an assumption we've made that it's going gonna, it's gonna to generate at that rate. And it's, yeah. That's what the rest of the use is. But I mean, if we were to if we were to take the zoning regulations and instead of bumping it up by ten, it would be thirteen or fourteen. You know, it's not it's not a significant difference. Um, we we could do that. You're, you're assuming that you are four hundred square feet, one space for four hundred square feet for the empty space, the fourteen hundred percent, fourteen percent that's vacant. Well, it's it's the t it's actually one space for two two hundred and twenty square feet is what it came out to be. What the rate came out to be? Cold, right? right. But the rate you're calculating is. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, what you're saying. Right, it's less. It's less. Right. I guess that's right. That conclusion for the future use. I guess that's one of my concerns when that 14 percent space becomes occupied. Right. Is that in the deed? So certainly, that's that's one of the biggest assumptions in the whole parking analysis. I support, you know, I, and I think many many others do as well. Support the whole idea of the shared parking stuff, right? We have it in our regs, et cetera. But it is a it is a pretty significant assumption in the whole calculation. All right. Let me just sure. The, the, this issue of changing uses came up in, in terms of our relationship in. in resolving 1160 and 1178 in that agreement. And I did have a discussion with, with Peter about that and the process that this town goes through. If there is a change of use in this, in 1160 or 1178 or any other commercial building, that change of use is required to right here. make a, a demonstration that the parking is adequate before that use is approved and can be commenced. It can't operate in a vacuum. It's got to present itself to uh, the Office of Development and to this commission, if necessary, to justify the use. So that what, uh, what we did was we took and got the direct information as to the uses in the building and what the vacancy rate was and, and used that as the basis for this analysis. If if all of a sudden the Webster Bank space, somebody arrived there and wanted to uh, put a 300 seat restaurant in there, that can't be done. Whether 1178 exists or not, it can't be done because 1160 doesn't have adequate parking to support that use. That use would require 100 spaces all by itself. There's only 117 on the entire site. So that there is a, an internal control within your regulations for this changing use. And, and there is, at some point, a maximum of, of uses that can be established on these spaces. And the limiting factor is always parking. Whether this stands alone or, or together, the benefit of having 1178 with this is, right now we have, based on Mark's analysis, we have a, actually have a surplus of 21 spaces greater than the peak that we would ever, that we ever estimate will be utilized. So we have a 10%, almost 10% factor of excess spaces. That works to the advantage, in my opinion, of both 1160 and 1178 because it provides a flexibility that 1160 standing alone wouldn't have, nor would 1178 if it were developed as a standalone parcel. So 
we're sensitive we were sensitive to this question eleven sixty is sensitive to it as is marty on eleven seventy eight there's a limit to the uses that can go into those buildings and it's totally driven by parking and and unless i've misstated our conversation peter my understanding is that those kinds of changes of use have to come to the to the town hall anyway certainly yes that was our conversation and that's why i brought it up earlier to make everyone aware that if if there is a change of use um, from something that doesn't exist today it'll have to go through that process and it'll come back for further analysis I can only assume that the owners of 1160 have taken that into consideration when entering into this agreement <laughs> <You wonder laughs> <who's so laughs> businessmen. Yeah. I, I can assure That's you that it was a carefully discussed <laughs> I'm sure it was <laughs> other questions on traffic this would also apply to the marshals possible change in use. I mean, it's a large retail with a pretty intense parking site there anyway, but as we said, if the town attorney's making some observation that the Marshall site opposed more intensity, maybe three to five more tenants, they'd have to come back just as we're talking about now. Yeah. Okay. I have a, um, just a question on the Silas Dean driveways. Sure. Just curious what the, what the options were as you guys were <clears throat> developing it, it looks like um, through through whatever you've done with the variables, you have more people coming in driveway three and more people leaving driveway two. Was there ever an option of making one an entry only and the other an exit only? Where, because does the 10 cars that you're getting exiting driveway three, does that help you not bust in with the intersection of Silas Dean and Mill? So just, just curious if, you looked at other options because the one thing that's popping out at me is there's four pedestrian crossings right now right and if we can reduce that by half it seems like a good idea but just I'm curious a how the model is set up where you have how do we know where more people are coming in the first driveway than the second that's kind of just a side question but more importantly do we need two entries and two exits yeah i, I suppose I, it's like was was something failing that we needed to do it. it it was discussed i think that you know the biggest issue was it it, it helps with the on-site circulation to be able to enter and exit in in both locations um the existing driveways today are actually there's two and they're the pre-existing driveways i should say they were they were actually full access but um no it helps with the site circulation uh, to have them both uh, right in right out um, but as far as, you know, the fact that more are turning into the site driveway three and more are coming out of two is more, it was a projection on our part. It's more kind of human nature when you're, you're approaching a site. You know, if you've got a gas station, for instance, you've got two driveways, most people take the first, and then most people leave the, you know, the closer one to where they're exiting from. So, um, so that's, that, that was the basis behind that. So... But, but in either way, you know, the, the total number of rights in and lefts out, or, I'm sorry, rights in and rights out from those two driveways, uh, it's going to be the same total number if we had it one driveway all in, one out versus in out on both. It wouldn't have affected the Mill Street intersection uh, distribution, I guess is what I'm saying. No, not, not necessarily that. I was just wondering that if we made it a one in and a one out, separated them however, however we did it, it sounds like nothing is preventing that other than uh, the on-site circulation would suffer from that, but not necessarily the fact that you'd be dumping too many people and it would queue through the building or something. Right, more, more of a circulation issue. And it, it, you know, it also helps to be able to provide that right in from the site driveway too. It, it, it helps uh, the 1160 uh, property as well, because right. now that you have the cross access, they can utilize that entrance as opposed to going through the Mill Street signal and kind of circulating back in from the north. They can also use it to exit. My engineering colleagues to my left uh, talk this way. <laughs> I see potential conflict if you come out of the southern driveway and go right and somebody's coming in the driveway that's, what is it, 100 feet maybe? Uh, and you got two full lanes on the Silestine with no uh, slowdown lane there, uh, it, it presents conflict. 
to some degree. And I think this is the point maybe they, they could be making over here too. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. You don't see that? No, yeah, I mean, we've, we've tried to keep the maximum separation of the two driveways. And the silos. I think it's far enough to, apart to not be a problem. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the person exiting from the, the southerly driveway has got to yield to somebody who's coming northbound and slowing down if you wanted to turn into the northerly driveway. Oh, so they've got okay. to yield to that person. Um, so even if he's slowing down, he's got to come in behind him. And so there may kind be of, queuing lines there anyway at Mill Street back to some degree. The traffic, so yeah, in, the, in the peak period, and at times that back of queue gets to the vicinity of the driveways, but, but it, it clears when the light goes green. So any of the backups are fairly, fairly brief. Question on the traffic, or should we move to the next topic? No, if you've got a, if you've got a new topic? Well, this is traffic. Why don't we stay with traffic? Okay. Traffic. Does anybody have another traffic, or should we move on? Okay, go ahead, Dan. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Have a seat. One, one, like, more, oh, okay. one more question. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> They'll laugh at me when I say <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think DOT really will approve all of this? I, I do. You can answer yes. <laughs> I, I absolutely <laughs> do. That's a safe thing to say. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, but it's really, actually... Do you have any doubts? Not really. Are I mean, it, it qualifies... Are you to do something else? So they may you say no to this? No, I mean, this is an administrative review. Uh, it's just a simpler review process through the State Traffic Administration. Um, there's no improvements warranted on the Silas Dean Highway, the State Highway, so uh, that precludes us from having to go through a full major traffic generator certificate They usually process. don't do this. I mean, Weatherfield Shopping Center, we had some on. And uh, a colleague told me, oh, yeah, it'll, it'll fly. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's... The, the fact that the, the state's already installing that new traffic signal there, and, and that's, that helps. That helps quite a bit. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. Introduce the next topic. Okay. Actually, it's multidisciplinary. Maybe I can address it to uh, uh, Peter, and maybe you can refer to the right person. Um, there are a number of waivers that you were seeking. Uh, Peter has already indicated that he has no real concern that he felt in his professional judgment are reasonable. And I don't doubt that. Uh, but I, as one, am, I'm always, I'm glad we have these within the regulations that we are able to, to talk about waivers. But I'd like to know if, for these waivers, can you get into a little more with specificity as to why the waivers are required? Sure. We, the various waivers. We just happen to have a slide of I'm that. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay, let's start with this. This is your regulation um, for the regional commercial zone, and it calls out that um, the commission may, by special permit, waive any dimensional requirement of these regulations for mixed-use development if the design implements the streetscape <clears throat> and architectural guidelines of the plan. So we feel at the outset that we qualify under that regulation to at least come forward and ask you uh, to consider granting um, the waivers. So may I go to the waiver? Okay, so these are all the waivers. Some apply to 1160 and some <coughs> apply to uh, 1178. And uh, Kevin Johnson, our landscape architect, spoke to the issue of area and width of several of the islands on 1160. Uh, as he indicated, we're trying to create an LA of islands and trees that leads people from the Mill Street entrance to the underpass of the building. And to do that, the islands have to be shaped uh, as he's presented them. Uh, for parking spaces between the building and the street line, we actually have a half of a space on the 1160 that is over the street line. I'm sorry, 1178, stand corrected. Um, and uh, we're asking you to allow uh, parking spaces slightly forward of the building setback line 
but recognizing that we're creating a significant green space, a streetscape as directed by the plan. Um, we have less than the required parking spaces uh, to do this for both sites. We would need uh, substantially more parking spaces if we did not have the easement agreement that we presented to you. Nevertheless, that's a waiver um, that we would ask for based on the easement that we've shown you. I mentioned the light spillage along the shared property line. It's just not possible when we're lighting the driveway on our side of the property and they're lighting the driveway on their side of the property not to have light spillage uh, that would exist there. On 1178, uh, Kevin mentioned um, the perimeter landscape areas uh, on the side property line. He mentioned that that loading area that we've established in the north boundary, in the northern driveway, in this area for residents and for service vehicles to the retail facility, uh, as, as Matt mentioned, we created a s separate access way so that those facilities could be serviced. Um, and it's just not possible for us to build some kind of landscaping artifice in there without creating a problem in the driveway. It is screened by the plantings that we're creating along the, the separating line between 1160 and 1178, but it's not a full landscaped area created just for the loading area, so we felt we had to ask, point it out and ask for a waiver. We had the same issue with several of the landscape islands on 1178 as we did on 1160. It was very important to create turning radii for emergency vehicles and for trucks. And in order to do that, um, some of those uh, area width of landscape islands are slightly reduced. Um, we do not, we cannot uh, meet the uh, landscape islands for 10 or more cars equated to 50% of the gross paving area. Kevin gave you that calculation. We're about 4,500 square feet short of that on a three acre site. Um, he pointed out the landscape island that doesn't have a tree. That's the next one. It's just that one. Everything else got treed. Um, again, we have a part of a parking space uh, between the building and the street line uh, on 1178 as well. And again, we have less than the required parking spaces to service 1178 based on the mutual easement that we provided. The same light spillage waiver as we have for 1160 applies to 1178, so we named it twice. Matt uh, has shown you some elevations which show that even though we have a five-story building, 63 feet to the parapet, and about 73 or 74 feet when you take into account the elevator shafts, it's comparable to the, the office building uh, to the north, and it's also comparable to the condominiums on Mill Street in terms of, of the height. So it isn't looming over other buildings in the area, uh, but it does. it is higher than what's called out in your regulation. Um, and, and so we've asked for a waiver of that. And then finally, uh, you would call out a density of 25 units. We first appeared before you with a proposal for 120 units. We reduced that to 111. But that still is uh, beyond, uh, in excess of the requirement of 25 units per acre. 25 units per acre does not make a suitable economic model for this development. And um, when Marty worked very hard on the plan, he shortened the building, he created uh, some different spaces within the building to increase marketability. The unit number went down, but um, 111 units is the financial sweet spot for this development that he really doesn't feel he can go under. 25 units to the acre simply doesn't make an economic model that um, all of the development that has to occur can't be accomplished in, in that way. So those are the waivers and uh, you know Peter had helped us 
work through these to identify all of them. Uh, I certainly appreciate his comments that he's not uncomfortable with any of them. There are no great waivers, at least in our mind, that we're asking for, um, given the nature of the plan and the quality of the development that's proposed. They seem like a reasonable uh, development plan, and they certainly <coughs> offer an incredibly better site than you currently find on the Silestine Highway. Uh, and it allows Marty to go forward with a plan that, that can work um, as a developer. So those are all the waivers that we've asked for and the reasons for them. Answers my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, is any? Oh, I asked the question partially before. Any of your retail uh, are real? I mean, you have you don't have anybody signed up or talking to anybody? It's just proposed, right? Both, three, three, three of them, right? Yeah. Uh, Marty Kenny, Lexington Partners. Hi. Um, the answer is we haven't signed anybody, but do we have very real prospects? Absolutely. And um, we have a group uh, uh, charter uh, realty out of Westport that leased up uh, Front Street, who's working on the property with us. And we have specific prospects for a salon and also for the restaurant that we're currently talking to. But we haven't signed anything because we don't have a deal yet. It can be difficult, but um, I wish you the best on that one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, access to Golf Brook. Um, are you allowing that? No. I didn't think so. Why? It's uh, we don't want to get we didn't want to get involved in a wetlands permit for that purpose. We we didn't the what program. For, for that purpose, in order to, to build a pathway down to Golf Brook, and it doesn't, it wouldn't. All the legal aspects to it. And it wouldn't go anywhere. In, in the west direction, you end up going under the Silestine Highway, and in the other direction, if you follow that a little further, you end up in that railroad trestle and where it widens out. I don't know how anybody could go anywhere. I guess you could go down there and stand there, but that well, would be about all. I don't all. mean necessarily a walkway along it, but to it for the residents or something like that. Or uh, we a really, short one along yeah. your part of it. We really did not consider that. No. I know it was brought up, though. In the, in the it, it's been asked, forward. yes. Uh, where are you going to dump the snow? Anywhere, right? <laughs> Well, we have, um, maybe you want to put up the site plan? Squad CLMP? Probably. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we have <laughs> islands within. No, not the dog park. No, we can't no, do that. I can't do that. Um, a, word on the dog, a word on the dog park. Uh, <laughs> what Marty has found in all of the projects that we outlined uh, that he's completed, there is a growing tendency for everyone who rents an apartment to have a dog. It, you can't not offer the opportunity for people to have a dog in an apartment. And so while the dog park is, it, it might be seen by some as an afterthought, it's not. It's, it's a real ne necessary amenity under the circumstances. But for, for snow, we have uh, quite an area um, that will exist to the south. And we also have the islands uh, and we do have some space to the to the east, beyond the parking spaces where snow can be deposited. If we have, you know, a three foot snowstorm, it's got to be trucked See, off the I'm site. Not, I'm not big on trees in those islands, but that's my personal opinion. Well, that's not uh, our regulations. So right, we didn't. Understand. We're trying to and comply that's with the, the regulation. Because often snow is dumped in those islands in many locations. In many I, I, I know Kevin. Center. Kevin has designed the tree called out the trees in those islands that are resistant to damage from that circumstance. Um, the design was, what, what do I mean by that? Okay. Um, it, 
any chance, and I guess I gotta ask, maybe I can't ask you, but the town staff. Uh, we talked about Mill Street and uh, uh, MDC paying for parts of it, perhaps the repaving, so forth. Can Mill Street be raised in a, uh, by a foot or two? I think it sits down like too far, and it's ridiculous in there. And, and we keep talking about the widening aspect, and yeah, I respect all that, and it's definitely needed. I hope it's sufficient. <coughs> And the queue line and all that stuff uh, that uh, we'll have, but uh, that's all good. Uh, but are you going to think of raising it? You probably can't because of uh, it's wetland. Well, I, I actually I think some of it some of it might be in the flood zone. Although I'd have to check the flood map again because there is a corner of it. So it depends on what part part of Mill Street you're talking about. But I mean, they they were not anticipating a, a reconstruction. They were just. Uh, talking it about milling and paving. Yeah, milling and paving. Um, you know, raising the elevation has all sorts of ramifications with the storm drainage system, utility, all the tops, uh, the sidewalks again, raising those all up. So there's utility poles out there. So the ramifications of changing the elevation. Yeah. So I think they were going to work with the existing conditions. The the pavement condition uh, is in dire need. Uh, so that uh, repaving is. Uh, Really, absolutely necessary, and more more necessary now that this project's going in there. It, just so, bad. just so you know, though, the town apparently has it on its list. Uh, so the town would probably, in partnership with MDC, be responsible for the the resurfacing. A uh, five-year capital improvement program that never gets accomplished. But anyway, sure. But really, it would help the steep driveway to the north. Really, it it, it would, but I think it has other, other ramifications that, that they didn't really want to get into. That's why we went to the north side. That right. Was one of the Is reasons. that what's happening? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Good. It's north side. Good. Yeah. Yep. One of the things that I read when going through the, the materials is within the shared, because of the shared parking, there was a comment concerning the condition of the pavement at 1160. 1160 is going to be resurfaced as part of this process. That's the answer I was looking for. Right. Good. It's bad. Rich, how many um, school-aged children do you anticipate living in this property? We've uh, had that question asked almost with every apartment complex that we've dealt with, and so we spent some time going back over other apartment complexes, both uh, more urban and less urban. The more urban, the f many fewer children there are. Um, in the Glassbury projects that we're most familiar with, uh, in the 55 units at Addison Mill, there are three kids uh, that live there on a fairly full-time basis. There are a great number of families that live in two, kids live in two places, and this is one of the opportunities is that one parent will have an apartment, and a child might be there on an occasional basis, but not living there in terms of going to school every day, um, so that the 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 market that apartments like this speak to is not family age w with children of of any age. Um, it's young people, millennials as they're called, and uh, people who are downsizing. They want to still maintain a presence in a community, but they don't want to own a 2,500 square foot house in a two car garage. They don't need it. And they spend part of their time somewhere else, either summer or winter, and they find renting an apartment suits their needs. Um, Marty in, in the tannery most recently has had a tremendous surge of those kinds of tenants. Their kids are all grown and gone, but they're very interested in being able to have a place in, in the town that they're familiar with. We expect the same thing to happen here, that a number of people don't want to leave Weathersfield, but they don't necessarily want to stay in a house in Pike Village. They, they want something so small. I see so that coming on stronger all the time. 
and the market supports it. Um, I know that uh, Attorney Roberts asked that question at the last time, you know, does the market support a development like this? Nobody is more sensitive to that than Marty because he's got projects coming online and he wants to make sure that they're competitively marketed, that they're uh, priced correctly, and that there's a demand. And um, everything, all the indications are that this trend is not slowing down, that more and more people are not interested in making a 30-year commitment to a residence with a mortgage, that they would rather pay rent and have nothing to do with any this, of that. This could not be converted to condos in the future, right? And he doesn't intend to do that. He, course, he does not, I'm and asking. and his, uh, the apartment complexes that he developed are all built as apartments. That's not to say that an apartment complex can't be converted to a condominium, because it can. Five to ten years from now. It's complicated, and it takes a lot of time, but it certainly could be done. The market, there's no market for, it's the same problem. It's the same issue as single-family houses. The, the market is not for ownership. Right, right now, it's apartments. I'm just saying right. that the others right. could go. I'm not going to say it could never be converted into a cooperative or condominium, <coughs> but that's not the plan. So, so Peter, you don't have a <clears throat> you don't have a hard number or hard estimate of the school-age kids that are going to be there. But I will point out that there's only 36 multi-bedroom units mm -hmm. right out of 111 the right? most popular so. units for empty nesters are two or three bedrooms right. they uh they the, can't the, downsize Marty was that sorry much. that he had t so few three bedrooms in the tannery because mm -hmm. every older couple that came wanted they want, this. They want an they extra room visit. for the grandchildren to stay in right. so and, and I'm remembering from a, and it's just, I'm actually saying this more for the public in case they have a, a desire for the number. We had another uh, applicant before us over on Ridge Road, and they were 75-ish. And I think they were thinking they were going to have 8, 9, 10 children tops, right? So just to put it in perspective. Um, that actually seems like a high number to me. To, to, compared to the number you just gave, right? right? Um, well, I think they were at a different price point, too. That, that's true, too. That's true. Um, can we move on to the architectural stuff? I, I know the site civil. Corey did such a perfect job. We probably won't have any questions for Corey. Um, <laughs> I would agree. But I, I have a question for, for Peter. Uh, we had design review, but they didn't really give a we approve, we concur. They said, come on back. So. Right, there's a whole, there's still a process in front of us. They, they do want us, as the uh, details uh, further uh, get refined, al although the details are, are pretty evident in terms of materials and the treatment of the exterior, uh, they do want to review it one more time before a building permit is issued just to make sure um, the assumptions that were made uh, at their level of review uh, continue on to the final product. So uh, I, I would classify their theirs as an approval, although uh, a, a preliminary approval based on the level of uh, design drawings at this point. So they just want to see the final. Uh, they've been doing that more and more frequently. Uh, they do want another uh, bite of the apple, so, so to speak. But um, just for the record, they did give their approval. Denise is uh, somewhere in the back there and can confirm that she handles those meetings. But you do have a letter, or you should have got a letter in the file to, to that effect. Final, what they're saying is the final elevations, including materials and colors, shall be approved by the DRAC, by the Design Review Advisory Committee. Um, they want to see signage, and right. outdoor and lighting is as it should be, uh, right. with full cutoff fixtures, so that's part of our proposal thank you so I'll move on to another topic uh, and this was asked by some letter writer some person living here asked about the appearance what are we gonna how do we control what it looks like after people are moved in grills on the grills on the deck laundry drying on the railing <laughs> towels towels right <laughs> Yeah, we, we have extensive regulations in the leases to uh, prohibit that. A any, 
any um, furnishings even that are on the balconies are uh, regulated and and we either will be providing those furnishings or uh, we would need to approve those furnishings there's no grills there'll be a, a separate grilling area um, so you won't allow grills then on the balcony. no no not on the decks there will be outdoor grills that'll be provided uh, by the ownership but um, they're not going to be independent grills that we won't allow those. I thought that comment was strange, but I understood it. Uh, so I'm glad your answer is. You know, and, and things like bicycles, things like, you know, uh, some people will have a child, they'll put, you know, you know yeah. plastic out there. We, we strictly prohibit that, and we have penalties. So that's a very important. Thank you. What do, you, what do you think, Tom? Uh, this does pertain a bit to the, the architecture of, of the facility. And since th there, there seems to be some question about uh, the number of children that may be uh, either residing or visiting uh, the facility, if it's, even if it's their grandparents that may be living there, grandchildren, and particularly small children. And since these apartments are going to have balconies, uh, can you reiterate what your safety standards for the you know the balcony railings uh, you know how they will protect say a child from falling off a balcony um, because there have been a number of cases of, of that instance that have occurred in the past uh, around the country and internationally that you can see across the front um, on the Silas Dean Highway elevation are also very similar to the balconies that are on the sides. This is a slightly older rendering. Um, the depth of these are roughly about three feet, so they're relatively small. Um, it's not like you can put a lot of furniture out there. It's, it's really more for a small cafe table and maybe a chair or two. Um, the railing that is shown is roughly 42 inches high from the finished floor and that's what we need to maintain per code. Um, so the, the mesh and the actual railing system uh, is again designed per code. It can't you know, have a spacing greater than four inches. So again, there's gonna be very limited ability for a child to go through the railing. Um, so again, again, these are opportunities to get outside, to experience the outdoors. It's really not a space for people to, to really have a large group of people out there, you're not going to be really spending a huge amount of time. So um, the activities would be somewhat limited. So the railings are going to have a mesh backing, is that correct? So right now we're looking at doing a, basically a mesh material, which is just you know metal that's probably either going to be painted or it's going to be a, a, a factory finish. Um, but that will have a very small grid to it. And by code, we're required to have roughly a four inch spacing. You can't pass a four inch sphere through the spacing, whether it's vertical or horizontal. It's really not gonna have a ladder effect, so it's not horizontal where somebody could climb up it. So it's gonna be more something, it's gonna look a little translucent, transparent, that you can kind of see in the renderings, so. Um, my next question doesn't pertain to a real crucial issue, but I'm, I'm curious uh, and ha a little concerned You've stated in the application that uh, there's, there's an intent to install solar panels. Uh, it seems like in two, uh, two separate areas of the project, one being panels on top of, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, parking space coverings, and also uh, some uh, uh, solar panels mounted on the roof. I'm somewhat disappointed in the fact that you had not, you've not finalized those plans uh, because that installation is going to require a separate application, a hearing, if it's not addressed uh, within this scope of this application. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Part, part of the, uh, as we went through the negotiation with the owners of 1160 on the, uh, on, on the whole reciprocal easements, how much parking we could have for solar was something that we went back and forth with because that, that was a challenge. And 
Um, we've also been sort of researching the structural uh, capacity of these solar carports so that we, we make sure that we have something that stands the test of a New England uh, winter. So we've been engaged with a company in East Windsor. Uh, we wanted to work with someone local who's very good at this stuff, um, but we're not there uh, completely with that. We know the spaces that we want to cover. We're doing the cost estimating and the solar generation for panels on, on both the rooftop and, and in the parking area, but we were somewhat restricted um, how many solar carports we could generate um, be, because of the, the sharing of, of the parking. So, so that's, that's sort of how that is. And, and um, you know, we, we recognize that we'll probably have to come back on that one issue. Also, I uh, noticed the plan, uh, the plan says submitted call for um, the installation of a charging station for uh, future electric, you know, pr I guess present and future electric vehicles. I saw only one charging station, though, on, on the, uh, you know, on the plans as, as, as proposed. Are you going I think to the idea was to get one charging station that could service two vehicles that are that are parked side by side, but okay. we we haven't finalized the equipment for that. There's several, you know, we've used them in our property in Glastonbury. We've installed them in Windsor, so um, you know, and, and and that has been a little sensitive to parking counts and the easements and those kind of things. So um that's that's also something that we're probably going to have to finalize that's a good point uh i wonder uh, since that's not finalized whether or not you plan to uh at least create the infrastructure for the installation of future you know of, a, of more numerous charging stations within within the project well I, you know I, I think the parking prohibits an extensive amount of those you know we see where electric car charging stations are going we want to provide as many as we can but you know uh, one of the challenges of, of this project is is uh, you know there's tight confines you know we've got we've got nature to the south we've got nature to the east and we have another property uh, to the north so uh, and and finally there there's a letter that was submitted uh, to the Commission by the uh, uh, the claimed owner of the uh, Marshalls um, uh, uh, shopping center, they yes. raised a couple of questions. I don't see that that has been or those issues have been addressed either in your presentation or in staff comments. I wonder the, if you could well, comment on those. I think one of the principal suggestions in that letter was that there be. Uh, reciprocal parking agreement. The, the author of the letter obviously didn't know that. That was part of our planning. I, I got that out of that letter. The, the second part of that is that um, he expressed the concern that somehow the overflow from 1160 or 1178 would end up in his parking lot. Um, based on what I see at, at that parking lot, the concern for me would be in the opposite direction that for the most part, it might be better for people who are going to shop at Marshall's to park in the 1160 lot and be closer to the front door than when you end up in the spaces out by the Silas Dean Highway. Um, he certainly is free to put up signs on his property that says parking for patrons of the shops in the center only and other cars will be towed. That's, that's really up to him to enforce, not us. We feel very confident based on Mark Fertucci's report analysis that we have more than adequate parking on our site for our site in 1160. We look, it's really kind of simple for us. If we don't have enough parking, Marty won't have tenants because they won't be able to park their cars. 1160 will have a, a tenant problem if they can't park their cars. And I know you're very sensitive to the idea that we need, you need to assure that there's enough parking. I can assure you that we are more sensitive to that because that's the way that we attract tenants. That if we put a restaurant in that space, they have to be a, have their patrons park reasonably close to that restaurant. 
the, the, the risk, while you bear some risk as a commission, uh, the developer bear, bears an immense risk. If, if Mark Vertucci is wrong, it's going to be the developer that suffers because there will be vacancy because people can't park. So that it, it, we're, it isn't as if we're trying to convince you to do something. We're convinced that this is satisfactory for this development, that it's going to work. Otherwise, it's, it's a, a complete financial disaster for the developer. We have far more at risk than either you do or the owner of Marshalls does. And, and Marty has to be satisfied. And, and one of the first undertakings he did, you saw the counts were done last November, was to make sure that we were going to have enough parking. That was a, 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 an absolute touchstone of, the, of this development. So, and I appreciate your concern. We share that concern. And that was a, the first issue we addressed. Because if we don't have adequate parking, this project will not work. It, it'll be, uh, it won't be successful. So it's more, more important to us than to you. We, we, we don't come in here to sell you a bill of goods on inadequate parking and think that'll be great we won't have any problems we have to know that we're not going to have any problems otherwise his project fails so uh, we all have the same agenda in terms of parking and we rely on experts like mark to tell us that it's going to work quite frankly i see a reverse problem i agree because go over to marshall's on a saturday and there's no parking spaces i, I don't shop there because you can't find a parking space so that's going to be your policing problem. Right. <laughs> okay, and and then <clears throat> then let's try and get to the public. Yeah. Uh, two questions: uh, <clears throat> the value of this project and the taxes to be paid to the town. A general, a guy early estimate. <coughs> I'm waiting to price everything that you guys throw at me. Okay. <laughs> Too early to ask. <laughs> okay, I tried. All right. Are there uh, members of the public that wish to voice an opinion? All right. So uh, why don't you just all start to make your way over there and maybe form a line that, to the extent that you want to stand there? Good evening. My name is Leo Field. I'm here on behalf of 1142 SD uh, LLC, which is the owner of the Marshall Shopping Center. Um, I want to commend um, the applicant. I think that this is a highly aesthetic and a very well thought out project. I've owned this shopping center for over 40 years, and I don't remember this property ever and, and 40 years is a long time to remember, but I don't ever remember this property being something that anybody would be proud of. This, this project really will improve that property. So I have no problem in recommending the acceptance of this uh, application. But I do have a couple of areas of concerns. You know that because I've already written you a letter. But before I get to those areas of concerns, I have one question which I would like to ask of the um, representative from Fuss and O'Neill. There you are. You indicated that the road widening would, that the queue for the road widening would be 175 feet when finished. And that, that the queue, the road widening would terminate before the driveway for 1160, 1178 um, Silas Thien. Is that, is that correct? The, the storage length. The storage length. Right, and the storage length would so terminate before you reach the driveway of 1160 Silas Dean so that there would not be any, um, um, the, the, the driveway would not be blocked when somebody wanted to drive out. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. What would happen with the driveway across the street at Marshall's? Is that also going to be open? Yes, yeah, the, the, the storage length's been designed to 175 feet to accommodate that maximum queue in the left turn so lane. So both driveways. So it will capture the queue before it extends back to okay. uh, both of the driveways. Okay, 
Good, thank you. Um, let, me, let me follow up on the concern uh, that was raised by Mr. Dean, um, at being the um, parking overflow. We have several other properties, retail properties, and we know from experience that nearby residential tenants will park in that parking lot. It's a, it's a given. We know that they tend to do that. I have a healthy skepticism of professionals coming in and making predictions of what's going to happen next year, next week, a year from now, or 10 years from now. I'm willing to give this um, developer the benefit of the doubt. All I'm asking of him is to put a sign on his property warning his tenants not to park on my property. Now, the attorney indicates that the fear is really reversed, that we, um, that my shopping center is so active that my tenant, my customers will park in their lot. What I'm willing to offer the applicant is that I'll put a sign on my property telling him not to park on his lot <laughs> if he will do the same for my lot. So, keep out. I, I get the point. <laughs> I'm not, asking, I'm not asking you to put one of these metal signs. You can get a nice wooden sign. You pay I, if you pay for my sign. <laughs> I'm glad this is staying light. <laughs> We're not getting a commitment here, are we? Okay, I, I, I'll accept that. I mean, uh, all I'm looking to do is ask you to run your property in a way that doesn't impact on me. <coughs> and I'm willing to do the same for you. That's, the, that's what I got my word on. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. Okay. The, the second area of concern I have is on the road widening. It's now proposed to be on the north side of Mill Street. There is now a snow strip of about six feet. I measured it the other day. And if you take two or three feet away from that snow strip, you're potentially impacting snow removal. It could potentially fall on the sidewalk. The Mill Street condominiums are on my side of the street. If you go down the um, south side of Mill Street, you don't have any such um, traffic. The people at the Mill Street condominiums use that sidewalk to go back and forth to Silas Dean. There's nobody using the sidewalk going down past 1160. I'm told by the site engineer, and I would never argue with any site engineer because that's not my thing, but we're told by the site engineer that there are two reasons why the um, road needs to be widened on the north side. First, because there's utilities, and second, because the snow strip on the south side is more steep than the snow strip snow strip on the north side. I think what I hear the site engineer saying is that it's more cost effective to put the road widening on the north side. It's not my project. I don't want to maintain the snow that's going to be dumped on that sidewalk. Let the person who's creating the issue, the person who's benefiting from the project, let that person deal with the issue that's being created. If there's a financial impact, let him build it into the price of the project. But he's going to have to widen on one side. The only difference is he's going to have to move some utilities. But I still urge you to accept the application regardless of what you do on these issues that I've talked about. Thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> Jim Woodworth, 33 Mill Street, 5H. Uh, I do happen to be the president of the board, but I'm not, I'm speaking as an individual. We haven't really talked about it as a, as a board, but um, we do are just down the street. And I, actually, I'm a little miffed that we were not included in the architectural context because it seems like our building has a lot of resemblances to or your building has a lot of resemblances to our building but be that as it may 
Um, <clears throat> I'm actually, th as an environmentalist, I'm thrilled with what you're doing uh, with uh, Gough Brook, uh, short of uh, raising the building and, and restoring the wetlands there. Uh, you're doing a great job, and uh, boy, I wish that would catch on with the uh, the uh, other tenants along there on the other side and, and further down as far as clearing invasives and planting uh, uh, plants, uh, not to mention the other, uh, how shall I put it, property that needs redeveloping on the other side of the brook. But that's beside the point. Um, <clears throat> we do have, uh, we do have uh, 40 units and 80 parking spaces and uh, um, <clears throat> many of which are empty in February when you did your traffic study because uh, half the building is in Florida at the time. Um, but really, uh, to do a traffic study in which you dismiss the traffic on Middletown Avenue as no growth, how does it have room to grow? It's incredible. And uh, <clears throat> certainly, and I haven't heard anything, you, t you talk about a uh, bicycle pedestrian friendly building yet the sidewalks end at the railroad tracks on our side and even before that on the other side uh, so that has to be completed I don't know whose responsibility it is and where it fits on somebody's traffic plan but gosh uh, and bicycle friendly with all that traffic I don't know um, it, as I understand it we're getting that left-hand turn lane whether this building goes or not um, which is a wonderful thing um, but boy, I would like to see uh, traffic. I mean, I'd like to see the traffic discussion include Middletown Avenue. There's a lot of young families. Uh, traffic goes whizzing by. Myself being one of the guilty parties, but on the other hand, I also bicycle that, and it's so narrow. People are parking on the street. You got to go around or right on the sidewalk. Um, there's not one single crosswalk. So hopefully. Somewhere in these plans, there's at least crosswalks at uh, Middletown Avenue uh, for those sidewalks that haven't been built yet, but hopefully are part of the plan. And then what, what kind of traffic calming can you do on Middletown Avenue? Can you put some crosswalks further down? I'd love to see the uh, east side of Middletown Avenue sidewalk extended at least down to the Great Meadows Conservation Trust Park on the, on the corner there, and then a crosswalk that would allow access. Um, <clears throat> but um, I think it's going to, I actually uh, worked in the Mercury Asylum once upon a time when I was in college, I think, or worked for the guy that ran that place. That's a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> and it was kind of a derelict building at the time, I think. Not to mention the fun zone, it wasn't fun for very long. So it's, it's great to see uh, that... Uh, that's going to be developed. I think it's going to increase the property value at our place, but that traffic situation really needs to be looked at very carefully. And, and uh, I don't, you know, whose responsibility in the next two years with uh, MDC, uh, it's not going to be fun, but uh, it is what it is. And of course, that's going to have a tremendous, wonderful impact on Gough Brook. Uh, and uh, so that's a, that's a good thing for those of us who care about the meadows. By the way, uh, you're a Wethersfield guy. Uh, one of the amenities is the proximity to the meadows of your pedestrian bicycle friendly building. And uh, anyway, thanks a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, and, and is, since, since DOT is involved in these things, and I guess it's administrative, but is there any hearing that will actually bring all the traffic people together? I don't know how much of uh, Middletown Avenue is, and, and Mill Street is state highway. I don't know if they they do that. So, yeah, Mill Street is not uh, under DOT's jurisdiction. None, none only, of it. Only the Silasdean Highway, but they would look at the development and the access points to the Silasdean Highway, and specifically yeah, and that's the, it, the huh? Mill Street intersection. Yeah, and they would. They'll take a look at all the counts elsewhere, uh, but generally speaking, their only major concern is Burlington yeah. Bike and Mill. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, it needs to be looked at. Of course, yeah. it would be nice to be paved well too. But that's thanks. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Good evening. Commissioner Harley and uh, rest of the commission members. Uh, my name is Evan O'Brien, for the record. I'm a resident here in Wethersfield at 43 Westway. 
uh, lived here for about uh, five years. I'm uh, here to support the project, uh, not to be critical. Um, you know, I just want to point out a couple things. I happen to be in the commercial uh, real estate business myself, and um, I'd urge all the commission members to uh, take a drive by, um, you know, the five or six apartment projects that Marty's completed the last uh, 10 years and uh, take a look at all the design elements and things that have been incorporated there. Um, he's a first-class developer. I'm sure he's going to do right by the town of Wethersfield, and um, I'm here to just voice my support. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. Um, first, I want to say it's just an extremely attractive design. Uh, by far, it's going to be the nicest thing on the Silestein Highway. Uh, having said that, uh, and I'm glad I'm not the first person that brought it up, but the uh, comments earlier about uh, what's going to be on the uh, exterior balconies um, regarding uh, clothes and towels and toys and so on. Um, I took an opportunity to look at the uh, development that Marty put up in Bloomfield, uh, Mallory Ridge, which I think he no longer owns, but uh, that development set back from the road. Um, but I did take a drive through there. I was more curious about uh, how many kids were living there, actually. But what I did notice was quite a bit of clutter on the balconies. And um, Marty's, you know, clarified that there's going to be a lot of restrictions as to what the residents can put on those balconies. My question is, what if the property were to be sold and the new owner doesn't have those restrictions or doesn't enforce them? So is it a uh, property owner's uh, restriction or is it a town planning and zoning restriction as to what could be kept on those balconies. Because you'd hate to see a building like that just get cluttered. Um, you know, we're going to be staring at it, but the, the residents, it's, it could be their back porch. So they, don't, they might not care what's out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good evening, Robert Gary, 17 Lumbo Drive. Um, I'm just here to speak in favor of this development. I think, obviously, we all want to see the property developed. But I think, um, you know, we haven't had good success in town recently, most recently, not that we've had many, with multifamily development. I'll take my favorite project, Ridge Road. Inferior condos that will now have apartments behind them inappropriately. So this is where we want to see apartment development in town. This is where we want to get um, residential diversification. I think people unfairly think that when somebody rents versus owning that they don't care what their home looks like. And you know, when you're putting up a quality product, I think people care what their home looks like. They're not going to fill their balconies with junk. Also, the other point I would make on this, um, you know, because the other apartment buildings on the Silestine Highway that are few and far between but are older and probably in need of a little love, you know, until there's a competing product that's better than what's on the market, there's no incentive for those owners to improve their properties. So what you'd also hope would be a secondary benefit of this building would be some um, improvements to existing buildings. And I'm getting my favorite thing, a left turn lane on Mill Street. So I'm very happy. <laughs> but there, there was a point made about sidewalks. And uh, that area of town has a lot of problems with gaps in sidewalks on Mill Street and Middletown Avenue that I hope the town will look at and address. Thank you. Thank you. Put you on the spot, Peter. Is there a sidewalk master plan that, you know, sidewalks in this area are part of? There's a townwide sidewalk inventory and gap analysis. Um, I did make a note so that uh, as I discuss the Mill Street plans with the town engineer and MDC to see if possibly sidewalks can be added to that gap at least to get down to Middletown Avenue. I can't speak to whether that funding would be available, but certainly I'll uh, forward that comment uh, on to the 
folks that be and see if maybe it can be piggybacked on on other improvements thank you just to make a couple of comments um, with respect to Tom Mazzarella's comment Marty has no objection to this Commission including a condition of approval that indicates that balcony shall be maintained in a however you want to link create the language clutter free or uh, in a appropriate condition that would allow the town if it were an issue to step up to the owner and say solve that problem um, and, and he has no objection to that I just checked with him um, and uh, while I certainly have a great sympathy for people who are concerned about Middletown Avenue that's really not anything we're dealing with Mark did do an analysis of the Mill Street Middletown intersection which is part of the report I don't think we have to go over it again but he found it was level of service a and remained level of service a uh, somebody who drives frequently on Middletown Avenue it's a place where you can go faster than you should that's straight and it's pretty wide open so other than that um, Marty has indicated a work with the person who owns the shopping center across the street to try to come to some accommodation and he was right on the signage so. is there anybody else in the public who wants to speak uh, all right so let's go back to some questions huh no, sorry, that, that, no, see if something else pops up other questions for the applicant Question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Right, uh, just on the parking again, um, just looking at the, again, I'm in favor of, of getting this property uh, upgraded, so I'm looking forward to seeing some new development here. But in terms of the parking, I think we've got some concerns. We've got personal some concerns there. So for the restaurant and retail, I think like there's about 84 spaces proposed or, or required during that peak period. Where exactly do we anticipate those folks parking? You know, I know it's just uh, uh, wings over here. They, we, they've dedicated some signs for, well, they've installed some signs for parking. So do you mean envision certain stalls for certain areas? I mean, is there going to be, that's my, my concern. That without any kind of parking plan, you know, there may be some chaos during peak periods. There are, there will be no deliberately dedicated spaces parking for ABC restaurant signage. Um, Human nature being what it is, people will park as close to the door they want to go in as they can. We think, Mark, you can certainly correct me when I get this wrong. We think that there'll be a heavy utilization of the parking row on the north side of the building with the create, as Matt described, that the breezeway access as well as access through uh, the front of the restaurant, that that will be a very likely place for patrons of the restaurant to park. And also, since it's in hours when 1160 will not be heavily parked, uh, it's likely that the first row of parking on 1160 would also be very attractive in that regard. Um, and, and then it, it depends on the, how the parking fields uh, in the back and, and the south and east are, are filled by residents. Um, but we think that those spaces that outlie to the north and are directly proximate to the restaurant are the ones that will be most heavily used. Are the 388 spaces enough for the 84 parking spots required for the restaurants and the um, retail? Sorry, can you repeat that? For the 84 spaces required for restaurant and retail, how many ADA spaces are required? In the oh, ADA. Right. Um, I'm not sure how you, that may be a better question for the site engineer, but is it? For, what is it for 84 spaces? 84 parking four. spaces require? Four spaces. Four handicaps. Four on the north side of the parking area? Okay. Correct. That's why we put those there. There are three there. And then there are two in the corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are three spaces here, and then there are two here. 
which are the closest to access to the, the retail facility. We had, in fact, started with them up on these spaces and uh, in meetings with staff, it was felt that those were not the best spaces because of the people exiting and entering the site and whether or not there would be a conflict of uh, backing movements in these in three right. spaces. In fact, I, it was at the last staff meeting, Peter, I think the suggestion by staff, I don't remember whether it was you or the town engineer, the suggestion was to move them down further away from that drive, mm -hmm. and we did based on that recommendation. Can, can you access the apartments from anywhere on the north and west side of the building? And, and the question is, is bearing on Tony's point about where the residents will tend to park. Because if the residents want to park in your north side. So the, the doors on the end, mm -hmm. then the breeze the the that's, yeah, that's, what, that's what I'm hoping, right? That's the right in right in that location, kind of where it's flickering. I apologize. <laughs> where the drive-through is is the where main the drive the entrance. Right. right. Where that pass-through is, the breezeway. There's also an entrance in that breezeway that connects to an interior corridor that runs right into the main lobby. So people can park on the north side, people can park in the rear parking lot and have access into the main residential lobby. You can come from it both sides. So that whole bottom floor has amenities, but there's also a common corridor that brings you into the building. So it's not something I would push on you, but you might want to tell the residents of the, you know, of the apartments to be parking in the back somehow so that you're not conflicting with your own well, commercial space, right? Yeah. So and people go into a restaurant are much more willing to walk a greater distance than somebody who lives in the building. I, I just wanted to uh, bring up one point about the parking that is really important. It's something that I've learned from experience. And, you know, when I first started working with Peter, the, you, we'd go to a town, they wanted three parking spaces per apartment building. Um, most recently in, in Windsor, where they're very smart growth oriented it was 1.25 spaces and there's a couple things going on with residents um, a lot of the people that are renters by choice that you know mean that they're gainfully employed and they get a good paycheck they're not there a lot they travel during the week they they go away on weekends um, someone mentioned about the condominiums they go to Florida we have people in our apartments in, in Glastonbury that go away all winter. So, you know, the percentage of oversell, and I own two parking garages and we have it too, it's 30% it's most times with people of, of this ilk. So it's something, you know, when Peter asked me about, when he mentioned the risk and everything, this is something that we've, we've seen now for 15 years and it's, it's an important distinction because it's not, like people are there every night and that's something you need to factor in when you when you look at you know the results everywhere else so well i'm already no, sure. go ahead. No, you're going to park keep on parking oh. i think it's it's wide open now not actually oh, yeah. okay. go ahead. it's not a parking place <laughs> That's a good question. One of the biggest things with, um, I guess, multiple housing or apartment or dorms right now is delivery. Delivery. You'll have Peapod trucks, dry cleaner trucks, and um, pizza. I know you're gonna have pizza trucks show up here every night. Has that been considered in your? I, mean, I, I love what you've done. Is you put the building up to the street as we had the South Team beautification of the parking line. But the idea of bottlenecking everyone through that one entrance way. I'm just saying it's, you know, put signage up or something like that to control. If, and it's a good point, and, and we are mindful of the, the changing way that people live and Amazon, you know, and all, all the deliveries that, that occur every day. It's why we created, it's, 
the extra wide loading area to the it. north side of the building where a delivery truck can park yeah, and not block out. traffic. Okay, that's what I was trying get to drone. determine where the loading was just for. There's, like there's a drone. Trucks. There's a drone landing on the top. There's right, a drone a landing deck. on top. That's a, on the roof. On the deck. That's the rooftop deck. <laughs> You're going to fly right to the balcony. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> a question from Marty. You, it seems you've. Looked at, I've looked at a lot of buildings, been in a lot of different places in the last several years. You've hit, <laughs> all, you've hit all the points. You really hit all the points. And it's like, I can't think of one facility around here that has a dog park dedicated to it. Haven't heard it. And uh, who is you your near? It wasn't mentioned. We're going to have a pet spot, too. So you can clean your pet. <laughs> Other than your project in Glastonbury to take Harford out of it, who's your nearest competitor with this? This type of I, I this level of rental. Um, Continental Properties Montage uh, over in Rocky Hill, mm -hmm. and, and the other project they developed in Brook Street, um, the Tannery over in Glastonbury would be competition. Mm -hmm. But what I like about this location is Rocky Hill is Rocky Hill. Weathers feels much closer to the actions, mo much closer where people want to be close to retail and services and the proximity to, to Hartford, going over the bridge to Glastonbury, the location at the end of the day, like in real estate, this is a great lo location. The problem is we gotta change the dynamic of, of, of the real estate that President sits there, and I think we can do that. Other questions? Have you ever done a like a roof deck similar to this on a building similar to this so that you, ha you have the mechanicals all around it and it seems like a lot of them, Matt, you wanna they, it's almost like there's one AC per unit. But just curious if this is ever, if this is something new we're trying or if it's something that you have and you have mechanicals kind of farm right. style around it. So the the mechanical system that we're choosing for this building um, has the mechanical unit inside the apartment, but then there's a condenser unit that sits up on the roof. Um, the project we're doing with Marty over at the tannery, um, those are kind of three-story garden-style apartments where the condenser unit actually sits on the ground on the perimeter of the building. Where we are somewhat landlocked, this is a fairly common practice to put the mechanical units, the condenser unit up top. Um, there's a certain length that you can run the, uh, the connection between your mechanical unit and the condenser unit is roughly about 150 feet. So that's why the units are spread out in all different parts of the building to minimize the length of travel so that that condenser can service the apartment. Um, we have done probably in the last five years, my firm has probably done about 10 of these roof decks. Um, so they're, they're very popular. Um, everybody wants to get up and out and take advantage of views when we can. Um, we did provide a picture of one that was in the uh, presentation um, towards the end, and that's in Philadelphia. It's a project called the Left Bank, um, and it's uh, a project that was done for a developer, Carl Dranoff, for Dranoff Properties. There, there it is. It's down in that lower right-hand corner, um, and that's... Um, an example of one of the roof decks. We also did a substantial roof deck on a project called 777 South Broad Street for the same developer. Um, and this project um, is very similar to the one that we're doing with Marty. It's podium style building with uh, four stories of wood frame residential on top. So um, like I said, uh, we probably have three other jobs right now that are in development where we're doing this. So it's like I said, it's, we're not, we, we haven't invented this. Doesn't get, doesn't get exceedingly noisy? Um, the roof decks? Well, with, with all the mechanicals around them. Well, no. The, the, so the, you know, one of the things that the condenser units provide is almost kind of a white noise when the, the units themselves are humming. You know, if you have one at your house, you know, you can obviously hear it when it turns on. When you get, you know, a hundred of these going, it actually creates kind of a white noise that blocks out all the noise from surrounding activities. So when you're up there, it's actually fairly calm and fairly nice. So um, 
you know, if Marty does have a bad unit, though, he's going to want to get up there and fix it because you don't want those things rattling and you don't want those, you know, getting out of control. You know, they're screened from the exterior, so you're not going to see them when you're up on the roof deck. You'll definitely take a, you'll you'll see it. Um, but as just as far as a feature and an amenity, um, there's probably nothing in the area that has this right now. So it'll help differentiate market, Mar and Marty in the marketplace. And like I said, it's gonna be a big draw. One of the things that we did at Mallory Ridge, which we really struggled with was, you know, we put a pool at Mallory Ridge, which it's the size of a puddle. I mean, it's kind of tiny. And so we argued with that, you know, but when we looked at the demographics in, Bloom in Bloomfield, nobody had a pool so we put it in there because nobody else had it and it was you know one of the things about renters is that a lot of the amenities we provide nobody ever uses they just like to know that it's there <laughs> so when their friends come they can show them this big fancy club room with a big screen tv and a pool table and a bar and they just know it's there if they want to go down and use it they have access to it but you know it's just part of having you know a, a little bit of everything so you can check the box Swimming pools, which were part of all the uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Oh, yeah. The apartments, no longer. Yeah, well, we... we the dog park. Uh, well, the, yeah, like Marty said, Mar we, did, we did a dog park at Windsor, at Windsor Station Apartments, and it's down at the bottom of the site, and it's part of a trail, and, it, and it's a great amenity. It's a great feature. So, um, you know, doing dog-friendly buildings are very important right now, like Peter said. kind of generally do you have a handle on what the site conditions might be in terms of <coughs> environmental contamination that will need to be addressed so um, most of the environmental challenges are uh, basically in the building core asbestos some remnants of lead. We have done all the testing for that. Um, we, we have done some testing under the site and that's come up clean. The phase two doesn't have any contaminated soils that need to be put off site. So it, it's primarily restricted to uh, materials that are in the existing building. Okay, good. Because those are, I mean, just our own high school project and I'm sure other ones you've dealt with those are the surprises that blow your Haven't budget you out of the way yeah okay. so so let's let's talk you know and then maybe some more questions will come out but um, going forward <clears throat> so we have a public hearing we could talk about whether you know it's appropriate to close it or not uh, there's a lot of comments outstanding by the town engineer, maybe not, you know, earth shattering, but they are outstanding. Peter has a number of them as well. Uh, if we close the hearing, we really can't get input on anything that might come across. So I'm, I'm struggling with where to go from here tonight, knowing that we don't really have everything. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dan, let's have his no, The only thing I'm concerned about, we, we, there are a number of things which still have to be reviewed. Uh, many times, in most cases, uh, there's a lesser amount, and we'll leave it to staff approval, subject to staff. But there's just so many uh, unanswered questions just from the town engineer alone that I, I, I think I'd like to have my hands around how this thing comes out and, you know, comments, you know, coming back from the developer, you know, and everything else before I would want to go ahead and just approve. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, I mean, frankly, that, that was the same thing I was thinking. I mean, the, the presentation has been complete, comprehensive, and, and well done. And, you know, frankly, I don't think any of the, you know, 70 or so items that are in all of the staff memoranda are going to be the end of the world or anything contentious. But I, you know, starting it 10 after 10 at night trying to sort through which ones they are and you know frankly we're looking at one of the most visible and significant projects that the town is <laughs> is going to be dealing with in the next couple of years I'd, I'd rather wait two weeks and let staff and the applicant go through everything and come up with 
you know, mutually acceptable stipulations and so forth. So, you know, at the end of the day, we may have five things to sort through, you know, two weeks from now rather than 70 to look at tonight. And, um, you know, I think given, given the nature of the comments and what we've seen, what we've heard, um, you know, I, I anticipate that that can be done. Um, but to, you know, to, to kind of echo Tom's point, I, I'd rather keep the hearing open just for the formality of allowing for significant back and forth between the applicant and their representatives and us rather than having to, you know, rely on staff as a conduit for things that we may have follow-up questions about. So I would echo and, and agree with Attorney Roberts that uh, if if we're going to work with staff, obviously in the next two weeks, but we we do want to have the opportunity to participate, and we can't if you close the public hearing. So, so do we think we're going to be ready in two weeks? Do we know what DOT? And I don't know that DOT is going to you know throw a monkey wrench into this, but. Will we know at all what DOT is thinking in two weeks? Will we know whether there is a uh, solar panel parking structure in two weeks? Uh, and are those things that make or break anybody's thoughts on this matter? It, you know, it, as far as the DOT is concerned, I can. We will not have an answer in two yeah, weeks. They, we, we did approach you know, you District started. One already, and they told us not to come back until we had approval. That they weren't interested in talking to us. So. Always say. Yeah. I well, mean, well, that's the permit side, right? But OSTA okay. is just the opposite, right? OSTA, you know, OSTA wants to know, and and they won't give you a final one until you have planning and zoning true. But they want to know right. it's being coordinated. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm talking with Jim Jerzyk at OSTA, he, he kind of indicated the same thing. Uh, if we're not anticipating any uh, improvement on the state road that would warrant, you know, a an off-site imp improvement or a major traffic generator application, then it, it wouldn't be something they would they would hold a pre-application meeting on. So okay. um, it could be handled administratively. So um, in talking through it with him, you know, he he suggested we just go ahead and finish, just submit finish the, the AD application, um, and and you know they can they can review it concurrently with you. So we're actually working on that now. We would be in position to submit it within the next two weeks. Okay. So. Right. So, as far as the encroachment permit, they pretty much said until OSTA. OSTA, there, right. That's, that's, that is the way it works, right? If you need an OSTA, they're going to wait for OSTA to, because they're the bigger umbrella. Right. right. Mr. Chair, I, I don't see any really big obstacle once we get all those points ironed out. But the, as far as the solar goes, <laughs> it sounds like they have quite a few options, on, and that's going to take a longer period of time for those folks to get that ironed out is what's out there and I'm sure it's a changing landscape daily probably on products that are available so I I mean I, I don't see that being the end all you know if they don't have a concrete answer on solar yeah. two weeks two weeks from now I don't see yeah. it coming that quickly. yeah and Kevin can stick in his last tree there if, that, if they don't go <laughs> <laughs> I think it was two trees so I just want to get the count right we won't need that waiver <laughs> So then we'll presume that we'll be hearing it again in two weeks, and uh, we'll it's leave. three weeks actually. Three weeks, even better. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I make a motion that we continue the hearing to Tuesday, June, whatever. Second. <laughs> Is that June second or uh, June the seconding the motion? June sixth. June sixth. Okay. All right. Seven uh, o'clock here. And I heard a second, so all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone in opposition? All right. Thank All you right. very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The tip to the top of your lip now. What would I do to get a little bit closer to you?